Welcome to DAX Machina, with your hosts, Naoma Finn, Steve Wildman Monrotus, and D.A. Roberts. Join us as we explore writing, books, authors, and all things horror. We will delve into the sightings, reports, encounters, and tales of monsters. We will also explore the writings of D.A. Roberts along with others in the horror genre. We will investigate the possibilities that monsters may not be safely locked away in the pages of books. They might just walk among us even now. Grab some popcorn and lock the doors. It's going to be a creepy journey. Welcome to DAX Machina. <laughs> Good evening, folks, and thank you for joining us for another edition of DAX Machina. Returning tonight is our guest, Fred Roll from Alaska. He's going to be talking to us about some Bigfoot stories and his project called the Hairy Man Project. And uh, tonight joining me in the studio is Anthony and Carrie Pocket, Doc Davis. Doc, you're punching in at the last possible second. <laughs> Slipped in just before the screen came up. Almost missed it by that much. <laughs> that much. Yeah. Doc, how the hell are you? Wyatt, I am rolling. <laughs> Fred, how are you doing tonight, sir? Uh, another beautiful day in Alaska, dealing with some fresh snow. Looking forward to it melting away to get onto some projects here. Heard you, uh, heard you got an inch or two up there. What would you say was like three feet? Uh, yeah, it had to just pass overnight. Down here, we got about eight inches, roughly. Uh, it all adds up though, because we got a little more than a foot just the other day. It, it, it's Alaska, you know. I mean, what do you do? Well, you know, it could always be worse. It could be, you know, four and a half, five yeah. feet of snow. Yeah, and that's what I'm trying to avoid because spring for us usually is uh, end of April, beginning of May before we get the leaves sprouting on the trees, you know. And then we got the other end of the spectrum with, with Anthony that's already in shorts and T-shirt weather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, what's the temperature where you're at? Eight. Eight? Yeah. And We're a eight. balmy 43. Yeah, and it's snowing. Oh, wow. So. Well, I better not get as much uh, much as Fred got, because your little leprechaun butt will disappear. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I know. Help, help. Yeah. Just, see, just see a hat moving through the snow. <laughs> There's Doc. What's My dog love it, though. Go? They, they disappear in the backyard, jumping through it. My pit bulls just poof, poof, bouncing around like rabbits. <laughs> It's fun to watch. I wish I had that energy. Our uh, our pit bull mix, whenever we get more than about half an inch of snow on the ground, he just gives me a look like, nope, I'm crapping in the house tonight. I'm not going out there. Yeah. <laughs> we got to make him go yeah. out. Get your little butt out there. That's a fact. <sighs> Well, Fred, I appreciate you coming back on the show. Uh, last time you were on, the, your stories were freaking fantastic. It's one of the one of the best Bigfoot encounter stories I've ever heard. Uh, probably the best one yeah. I've ever heard personally. I mean, I've heard some really good stories that I've collected over the years, but your your story was the best one I've ever actually personally personally taken. And oh man, what a great story! Uh, just kind of kind of wet the whistle of those who may not have joined us that night. You want to give us just a little bit of a recap of that? Just a couple minutes. Yeah, so uh, back in 06, we went on a, a gold panning trip, go prospecting on the New York River, which is way up the New Shigak. It's the largest tributary. And uh, we're about halfway between, uh, about the halfway point of the New York, probably seven, ten miles south of the uh, Kick Chick State Park on the New York. Anyway, we're up there to go gold panning, and uh, we, got, we got up there unloaded stuff. Everything seemed fine. It was getting close to dark, so we just kind of huddled in there. We're making our plans, and the whole place creaked. And, uh, you know, talking about it more in, in recent past is, is really those, some of those minor things that you don't realize until later when you're actually calming the mind down to think about it. Uh, there, there was no telltale signs. There was no deafening quietness or any creepy feelings. Cause like I've said before, we've been around them more than once and it was never on that kind of level. So what ends up happening is one of them 
pushes against this little shack. This little shack is eight by eight. It's nothing. It, the whole place creaks. So we immediately, you know, I saw something move over my uh, younger cousin's shoulder. And immediately I'm thinking a bear because we're right on a bear river. And it, it was the only thing that made sense that we're aware of the hairy man, but we don't go out prepared for the hairy man. It's never an issue. It, it usually, they scream, shake something, and you go about your way, and there's no problem. But uh, so when we went out there to check on the bear problem, it uh, ended up being something totally different because when we panned to the tree line and we saw the three sets of eye shine, that changed everything. Um, it, the the whole thing just went. Everything was off. The the pressure. Uh, and I still can't describe that pressure properly. It's like coming off an airplane and your ears haven't popped, but with a little more pressure to it is the best. Anyway, so we seen that immediately knew deep within us something was off. We jumped back in and we, we shut this little J hook. It was nothing. We're in there just moments and all of a sudden, you know, I'm discussing what the hell is that? I, we knew it was a hairy man. We didn't outright say it at that point. But we're kind of like, you know, what the hell? He immediately just smacks under that table so fast. It was, uh, I've never seen movement like that. And at first, me and my uncle, we look at each other down at him like, what the hell? Because this is all within moments. Me explaining it is way longer than how it transpired. So we notice he's looking at the window across the room. And I could, uh, where I'm standing with the shotgun at this point, that window was like three feet away from me at that so we both look over at the same time and as i make eye contact with this thing it turns this gaze from my my cousin to me and it scowls its eyes and it's th there was no question at that point it was on it was this thing came over me just defend yourself kind of thing and on autopilot i start shooting there was a scream the whole place just kind of i thought they're going to push us in the river that that was and Anyway, so I don't want to get caught up in the thought because in my mind, the memory so fresh. It, so, play shifts, it goes dead quiet. And when I mean dead quiet, I mean it, it's dead quiet. Uh, I hear sniveling from my younger cousin under the table. My uncle's in the back where there's no windows in this little cubby area that's an old 50s style trailer. And he's sitting on a bunk. He's, he's not offering any conversation. It, it's just deafeningly quiet and it was like that for hours uh, i mean i was sitting there terrified trying to get someone to like acknowledge what the you know what the hell is this well as that's happening or whatever and i'm sitting there and, oh man moth hitting the window bro let me tell you it happened a couple of times while i was sitting there but uh, just the the constant electrical jolt to the system it even now, it's been 15 plus years. It's still, I still, like, I still have issues with it because there's so many things that bother me about it. Anyway, let me let me carry on so people can catch up. So I sat there for hours, uh, not deafening quiet. Finally, my younger cousin starts talking to me. He tells me it showed him his teeth, and he just, you know, lost himself and was under the table. And we decided, you know, I was trying to get the game plan. Let's get the hell out of here. But it was pitch black at this time. It, leaving right then wasn't really an option because there was so much deadfall in that river. Uh, we didn't know that Alaskan rivers are deadly. There's never a warm river to swim in around here, ever. Not even in the middle of July, ever. So we didn't want to risk that. Nothing else had happened, and it had been quiet for so long. It was kind of like a, a false sense of security almost because of how long it had been. <laughs> so as we're, uh, we're discussing things, I, I, honestly, I was so terrified. I don't know how much time had transpired between him communicating and us coming up with this game plan. But anyway, we're going to make a break for the boat at some point. And as we're discussing it, I told him, you know, it's close to first light. Right? He's like, well, let's, let's beam out there. Let's, let's beam out there and see if we can see anything moving around. I'm, okay. We had to uh, kill the 
overhead little Coleman lantern uh, pain in the ass, white gas. Uh, we had to kill that because on the side towards the river when we beamed, it, there was no uh, mirrored effect from the, the lantern, but we went to the side where I shot next to the window. We had to kill the lamp to be able to, to see out with the beam because we were getting a mirrored effect and couldn't make anything out. So we did that. We're beaming. And once we got to the outhouse, that 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 big black mass, man, um, that was the the most unreal it, it was a nothingness like we talked before it was like it was absorbing the light and so everything yeah I, we shut it off we're, we're tucked back into that cubby as well and I, we had a barrels crossed man it, it was it was chaos for I, I i don't know how long because i mean i was so close to not holding it together because of the, how intense the that pressure never stopped it was really uh, surreal. Uh, resigning yourself to death is something it's hard to explain. Uh, but that's essentially what I did is, uh, all right, I'm dead. And it freed me a little bit. It helped me not be so terrified to, to move around as much because I had accepted, okay, it's just a matter of time before I'm either smashed, bit in half, what, whatever was going to happen. So... As we're sitting there, everything's quiet. It's getting lighter outside. And I, it seemed like about 45 minutes, but again, I, was in a, I wasn't in my right mind. It could have been longer. Um, it sounded like rotor wash in the, in the near distance. You know, just thump, 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 thump. We felt it in the ground, and it was one of these fuckers running by, man. Um, 2020 hindsight, I think after I initially shot, everything else was like, to lure us out or see if we continue shooting because had we not seen that ice shine we would have been ambushed we would have walked right around the corner right into this thing's arms that's 20 that's speculation of course but looking back over it and mulling it over that's the only thing that really makes sense because they, they could have easily had us easily it was like they're feeding on our fear and that's that's the most troubling part. What what are they getting from that fear? Are they trying to adrenalize us and get the adrenochrome or some crap? Uh, who knows? You know. But yeah. anyway, I digress. So this thing runs by, and then it's like a, a light switch hit, and there's a bunch of them around. It was like they were staged, and they just boom, 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 boom. You can tell they're sizes as well. At one point during this chaos of them running around, you could hear like you could hear the Think something was sniffing the trailer. Uh, that's one of those things that I, w I could have let my mind hold on to that, but as I've been thinking about it and flashing back to certain moments, that that just keeps like it was sniffing the damn trailer. You know what? Anyway, so that goes on for a little while, and then it stops, and it's like as that was happening. It, 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 it was like in waves. It was like they would run around a little bit and back off and then do it again, run around a little bit, back off, almost like they were trying to see if we were going to shoot. And again, that's speculation, 2020 hindsight. So nothing comes of that. It gets quiet again, and it's getting lighter out, so we're, we're really building up our nerve. We're going to make a go of it. We get our game plan. And as we're, we're discussing things about, you know, you remember that tree down over here as we're coming up the river, things, things of this nature, because it was still going to be pretty dark when we got out of there. Uh, we're standing there, and it sounded like some shot a pellet gun at the damn shack. Just tack, tack. And it, it just it started with just one and two, and then all of a sudden it was like a hailstorm of it against the side. And uh, that, that really unnerved us. Because we, we had just built ourselves up to be able to make this push to get the hell out of there. So that really took the wind out of our sails. And again, I I'd already made up my mind. I'm a dead man. So I'm, I'm going to save a round no matter what. Not, like I said before, not for me, but for one of these fuckers when I got close enough. Oh, excuse my language. No problem. For when one of these things got close enough, you know, I'd do the most damage I could before I went out. Well, after the hailstorm and everything, it all calmed down. It was light enough where I could see without the spotlight all the way to the tree line. And I'm 
I, I'm, I'm peeking out little by little. That I don't see nothing. We check the bank side to make sure we're not going to hit a, any kind of ambush. There's nothing. It's dead quiet. There's nothing. And the boat is 20 foot of trail. It drops down about seven foot drop to the riverbank right at the sea. If everything's there, we could go. It, it is all right there, but it seemed like 10 miles away. We get stacked up and we're out the door. Boom. We hit the edge. He, my younger cousin jumps down because he, he was the one running the skip anyway. It was theirs. Uh, he jumps down to start it. I help my uncle from behind me and I lean down to help him down the bank because the grass, it was in a road that roaded high bank. I help him to get his footing and I backed up just a little bit because the way I was standing, I'm, I'm holding it I got six at this point. And I got his old shot got flung over my shoulder because my uh, younger cousin took my shotgun. So anyway, I, I scoop back, and I, as I stand up, as I get to full height, that rock whizzes past my face, and, and everything goes slow motion because I felt the air from this rock. Had I not scooted back that littlest bit, it, it would have took my head off. And it impacted the river in about three feet of water so hard, it hit the bottom before this moving river could close over it. Uh, uh, that, that's some force yeah it, and and this is all just like booms it, it's all happening really fast uh, explaining it, it it took less time anyway so that happens and immediately my eyes whip over to the, the direction the rock came and that big black thing was coming out of the trees and as that was going on um i shot at that one because i felt that was the one that threw the rock i had no i wasn't looking you know, I don't know which one through it, but there was movement in the tree line along each side of it. So, uh, so I shoot it three times center mass. Boom, boom, boom. I worked that bolt action real fast. And it stopped moving forward, but there was no no sign of any kind of – I heard it hit it. Uh, I'm, I'm a good shot. This thing just, just took it. And it wasn't moving. It was Three so pitch black I couldn't make up. Face. Yeah, 180 grain. Uh, it was the Corlock soft tips, uh, deadliest mushroom. And with, with that round, I've killed coastal brown bears, uh, moose. Uh, anyway, that bothers me too. That I, I shot it clean, you know. So immediately, once it stops moving forward, I, I know it's go time. I only have one more round in that 30 out six. And like I said, I, I wanted to have something. So I jumped down. He didn't cut the bow line. I, I had to cut that. I, I shoved my, I, I feel bad about it, but I shoved my uncle in because he was doing the little slow boat to try to kind of kick his feet in and swing him around kind of thing. He was in his upper 60s. So, you know, I, I shoved him in and get that cut. And all this is happening really fast. I, I slide the 30 out six into the bow as I'm trying to lift up. And I noticed the shotgun that my new shotgun is laying out on the bank. And I was in my mind, I was like, okay, I'm going to grab it. I, and I still never got an answer about how, why he threw it down on the bank. I think it was so his dad had access, I guess. I don't know. And we were all panic stricken. You got to understand we had just went through hours of mental torture. So I'm, I'm attempting to, push off and I'm, I'm about to grab it and all of a sudden I noticed you know he was he, when I got down there he had it idled really high he had it started but it was uh it was idled too high to ship so I'm yelling at him hey idle idle down calm down idle down get it shifted and just as he shifts it and I'm, I'm going to lift to push off the bow uh, his face goes white my uncle falls backwards in the skiff and they're looking up at the bank behind me, and I just kind of turn back and look up, and I only made it to its chin uh, before everything was just so tunnel visioned and just like it, it was surreal. You know, it, it was standing there above us again, had us dead to rights. I, I don't, I don't know why. What I learned later, though, once I pushed off, and we were starting to skip away before we got on step. Um, I talked to my cousin. Oh, it, it was the weekend before I went on with uh, Carrie and them on Odyssey. And I, I was asking him, I ran through everything I just told you guys to ask him if there's anything I'm, I'm forgetting or missing out. He, he didn't say much. He said, you didn't, 
you didn't mention them throwing rocks at us when we left. Now, I didn't remember that part. I I was in the bow of the skiff looking for rounds for that 30 odd six, trying to, uh, there was still movement going on around us. So, according to him, and, and again, I'm in the bow, I got tunnel vision, I'm like looking at this open bolt, you know, trying to funnel for rounds. He was cutting back and forth in the skiff as we're getting up the steps. And unbeknownst to me, it was because they were chucking rocks at the outboard. I, I did not see that part. Once we left the bank, all I saw was movement on the bank line to our left just, just for a little while. Um, but again, there's parts of it that are just like picture frame, you know. And that was essentially what had happened. Uh, outside of the trip back down to Dillingham, which was really, that, that was like, it, once we got back to Dillingham for like three, four days, I could barely move from just sitting there hours on end hurting. Um, and just from, I was so tense for so long, my, you know, my muscles were locked up and yeah, it was, man, it was horrible. And now, now I'm planning on going back this fall. <laughs> <laughs> to, I, to I would love place. to be able to come up there and go with you. I, I really wish I could. Yeah, I'm hoping it'll help with that. I don't fear these things. I went out the next year, you know. What bothers me is I've been told a couple of times since and, and once in 95 that I'm marked. And I, don't, I, I respect the tradition, you know, and I, I respect those old myths and wives' tales. But having something like that in my head, getting ready, Getting ready to go out and film a documentary that oh I'm marked and they're after me you know that's not a that's not a thought I want to hold on, on to <laughs> that's for sure I completely agree uh, a couple of quick questions from uh, some of the people that were mentioning in the audience uh, did you notice uh, were they uh, like the typical flat face Bigfoot or did it have a pronounced snout no flat face uh, kind of like uh, yeah, those old Indian pictures, but with a, a flattened nose, wider, mm -hmm. uh, really, really pronounced jaw. It was uh, at the one I looked at. The the other smaller ones had a very similar uh, kind of silhouette because I wasn't focusing on them very hard. It was what was closest, but that big one had no features. It, it was pitch black. However, I noticed when I had the tunnel vision on its shin, um, there was enough light outside that the, the very tips of the hair on its shin was like a, a rose-colored amber kind of hue to it. It was really weird. Uh, I don't know how or why because I beamed the damn thing and it didn't, I mean, it absorbed light. You know, it didn't reflect anything. So, yeah, I have unanswered questions about that. And that's one of the driving forces to going back up to the New Yorkuk is to maybe get some time on boots on ground time to investigate around there. Cause we weren't there 24 hours. We were there maybe two hours before it got dark within a half hour of it getting dark. We were lured outside and you know, that's how it went down. So, so um, I don't know if there's even answers out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know in Alaska, the hairy man's got a pretty dangerous reputation. Is that the same thing as what uh, yeah. the natives refer to as Nantanok, or is, uh, is that something else entirely? Uh, it's the same thing, just different uh, dialect of the Yupik language. You got the Alutic, the Chik Chik, or not Chik Chik, but um, Klinkit, and, and various other, like uh, Inupiaq, Eskimo, excuse me, dialects of Yupik. So, um, and it varies wildly. Uh, I, I didn't retain any of the uh, the language myself. My grandma taught me when I was young, but I didn't hold any of it because we moved away to different places when I was little. But yeah, it's known by many names: um, Harry Man, Nantanak, Chikayo, uh Jeez, and, and other ones I can't even pronounce. I can't get the uh, the epic, epic kind of kind of throat noises that they use to make those words. I, I never uh, held on to it. 
Yeah. One thing I wanted to share with you, I had mentioned on the chat. Uh, forgive me, I'm driving. I'm not trying to ignore anyone. But no the, problem. Uh, I, I mentioned the bear killers. And I was told by uh, some elders about their experience with the, the bear killers on Yagulawak. I, I've had an experience there myself. Well, I'm going to be sharing in the documentary, so I'll leave that out. But um, what I was told is uh, up on Lake Elekmigik on the uh, far northwestern side, I guess it would be, because they kind of a string of lakes and they run kind of, uh, I guess it would be west, northwest, kind of a angle if you're looking at them on the map. Well, at the far uh, northwest end is a place called Sunshine Valley. And just before you get there, there's the Agula River, and that river connects Lake Electric with uh, Lake Nurka or Lake Beverly. <laughs> so, back when this happened to them, they used sailboats for salmon fishing. So, this was a lot. This, these were some old timers that told me this. And they took their sailboat and they were going up to uh, a place we call Bear Bay, called Bear Creek. The millions of red salmon, sockeye salmon, return there every year. And it literally looks like boiling blood when you pull up in there. And it's yeah, crystal clear water, fjords next to it. It's beyond gorgeous. Well, this particular area, they had sailed up in there to uh, Munyuk get some uh, get some humps off the backs of the red salmon. Because any salmon, once they hit fresh water, that's when they start turning red. So when they initially get in the river, if they're still bright and you catch them on rod and reel, you know it's fresh because it has started changing colors. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just some knowledge there. Anyway, so they got up in there. They anchored out their sailboat. And as they were, uh, they were using small little hands around that to pull in some red salmon, they heard a scream off in the distance. And this was uh, in the distance of Bear Creek where they heard this uh, scream coming from. And they kind of looked at each other because they already knew it was a hairy man, but they figured, oh, okay, we're, we're anchored out. We're good. And, and they were. They, they were in a safe spot. Well, the, the screaming continued, and it, it uh, they said it sounded like a freight train coming towards the edge of the uh, little bay there from the trees. And it was a big bear running. And it ran down the shore a little ways and then crossed Bear Creek and went start back up the other side when a hairy man jumped out of the bushes and snatched it up and slammed it down. And the one that was chasing it was already following on the inside of the truck. Just thinking about what they were doing, it just gives me the creep. So there was an, the one that was initially chasing it was stayed within the tree line but went towards Bear Creek and... Uh, came up right on the back side of them and joined in and they each grabbed the side and they twisted it like they were ringing a big towel or something and it basically broke its back and spine and sat there and, and tore the thing into uh, multiple pieces and started eating the gut and uh, just lapping blood up and things like that and uh, seeing how these things move and, and the force that they can possess like with the rock throwing and stuff mm -hmm. just the, just the thought of witnessing something like that and it was it was broad daylight when this happened it, it was broad daylight and uh there's there's places up here they they don't give a damn uh what you got with you if they're around they will come in on you and i, I try to i want to warn people you know we got a lot of missing people up here and i'm not saying they're all hairy man related don't get me wrong but there's something else going on because it's like what's what happened to me i'm not unique there's other people i i've i've got interviews lined up and, and already recorded as part of the documentary that it's not not one good experience not, not one i wouldn't say they were all like life and death but every encounter has been aggression behind it even with uh the very few people that are coming forward at the moment, which, you know, I get it. In our culture, uh, we don't go squatching. We, you know, we're always taught, leave them alone, don't follow them. You know, they'll eat you. So we don't have a, a culture of uh, 
engaging them like they do down on like Vancouver Island and you know other places in DC. We we don't have that kind of culture up here. That it's all bad. Well, it's a, it's a dangerous creature. I mean, you know, any big creature, especially a large predator, is it's not a smart thing to follow. Right, and and I man, just that, that that primal fear I had, you know, just before I started shooting. There's there's pieces of that that don't seem like my own fear, like it was being projected onto us, like it was an oppression. It wasn't like mind speak or anything like that. Uh, because if it was, I would have been like, leave us the hell alone. But it, it was uh, a pervasive fear. It was constant. It was, uh, yeah, it was constant. It, it didn't, it didn't vary or fluctuate the whole time we we're in that shack that night. But, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm biased. Everyone out there, I'm biased. I don't trust these things. Uh, I got no gifts. None of, none of that. Uh, I wish it was like that. It wouldn't be so uh, intimidating going in the woods. Yeah. Well, I, I don't blame you. If I had an encounter like yours, I wouldn't have anything good to say about them either. Right. Um, well, the next year, they, you know, at least three of them were trying to come in on us when we were on the riverbank on the Nushigak. And this was, gosh, almost a couple hundred miles away from where the incident happened on the Nushigak. So, it it wasn't isolated behavior just to that one spot, you know? Fred, let so, me ask you a question. If you don't mind. Yeah. All right. You, you know how they say they're <clears throat> most, a, a lot of them do not like cameras, don't like infrared and all that stuff. Have you, have you noticed that? By you or no? Are they totally different? Do they act no, differently? No, I've never, I've never personally uh, attempted to film one. <laughs> We've always, uh, like I said, our culture was always you go to the other way. And right. I, I'll soon find out. Okay. I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been writing stuff down to be aware of just other people's observations because I, I don't go squatching. It's not in our culture, but knowing what I know, I'm not going to be an idiot and just dismiss people's uh, methods just because it may not have been, you know, fruitful for them in some way. I'm going to hold on to some right. of that. And, and they knew that you were holding a rifle and shooting at them, too, and they didn't need yeah. it. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes, they did. That thing and didn't I even move. They remember me. Yeah, because uh, I'm, not, I'm not Bentley badass. It's just... You know, someone, I've seen a lot of comments, well, they didn't hurt you. Well, no, I say bullshit. I have yeah. no relationship with those family members. It caused me to drink heavy for years after that. So, yeah, it, it, it did, you know. Uh, it, it, yeah, so. Yeah, it mentally, it mentally that, did it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was, I mean, honestly, I was, it was almost like I had a death wish for a few years after that, like. I don't know if it's a weird survivor's guilt or something, but it was hard to, uh, I had no one to process it with. The ones that I went through it with weren't communicating. It. They didn't, it got to a point where I was pressing them so often about it, they stopped acknowledging our trip, you know? And it was like, right. how could you guys shut down? You know, you guys were right there with me. You know, you may have seen things I did. You know, I was stuck in tunnel vision, scared shitless. Mm -hmm. Well, some people can only process a, an incident like that by just never mentioning it and trying to block it out of their mind. A lot of people, when they have a, an encounter with a cryptid, be that a dogman, a Bigfoot, or even a chupacabra, it's generally so terrifying that they don't want to talk about it. They don't even want to think about it. Right. Yeah. Well, like when I was, uh, when I just recently got that uh, Gula, uh, Gula Walk River story I was telling you about. Uh, mm -hmm. These guys were in their 80s and 90s. They didn't want to talk about it. Uh, they shared with me because of another relative that happened to mention that I was marked. So they they wanted to warn me and tell. Me. And I was like, no, no, I trust me, I understand. They're dangerous. Well, what do you mean, Mark? But again, Mark? every elder I talked to, uh, one of my great aunts told me back in 95, I was talking to another cousin about. Uh, 
we got screamed at at a berry patch. And I, I was just talking to another cousin saying, hey, there's a hairy man up by Snake Lake. You know, watch out if you guys go out there berry picking, you know. And uh, she was in the background. And it was their pinnacle night or something. And she called me over and uh, she said, what do you know about the hairy man? I said, I know enough to stay away from it. She goes, how many, she asked me how many times I saw it. And I told her, you know, roughly at that point, you know, handful of, not a handful, but, you know, a couple of, up, not immediately up close but close enough to make it out and then you know the ones screaming in the distance and running or whatever and she told me i was mark and then she started to speak in pick to my grandma and i asked you know hey what do you mean mark and she didn't elaborate so i never got any uh, any contact with that remark and and it was the same with every elder since then that has mentioned anything which is only two others but they had made mention of it being marked but they wouldn't expand on that so I'm kind of that that's another part of it is like why why not just tell me what that's supposed to mean you know don't keep me guessing because I'm, I'm going back out there you know maybe I, it might be some needed information but um, they didn't elaborate so the uh another question I had the uh you you said the, the was it the Yupik tribes well yeah you got it it's, we're all Yupik Indians, but it, it depends on where you're at. Like, Aleuts are basically coastal dwellers. Uh, the mm -hmm. Inupiaqs are up by the ice. Uh, it, it breaks down in that way, but it, essentially the same Indian, different tribes. Yeah. Uh, well, what I was going to ask is, I, I if, if I remember correctly from what I read and a couple of people I'd spoken to, uh, they believe that uh, the Bigfoot has supernatural abilities. Yeah, I, I personally I haven't seen that. Um, the the strawberry blonde female we saw one time was kind of a caramel color. Uh, we wouldn't have noticed her in the grass if the wind hadn't have blown and moved. Uh, we just gotten up to this alpine meadow and the wind blew and it moved the grass enough to where we made out the outline. And uh, she stood up. She was about a seven footer and. You know, that guy, Todd Standing, gets a lot of grief because he's kind of a D-bag, you know. Uh, but that blonde face, flatter face looking one in his video, his documentary, uh -huh. the female I saw looked very similar to that. That's why when I, uh, I get to so think about it, but when I first saw his video, that is what convinced me that, oh, this guy's the business, he's just a douchebag, and he's a wannabe know-it-all, so no one wants to listen to him. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, I saw one with that complexion, but it, when it took off running after it screamed at us, which is the running thing with these things up there, they'll scream at you and run off. Well, uh, she screamed and, and ran, I mean, fast, real fast. And once she hit the tree line, it was like a baby duckling going into dead grass just disappeared because of the natural camouflage. It just blended in seamlessly. Uh, we only knew she was still in there because of the noise being made. And then we heard noises about 250 yards behind us down along a tree line we just passed. And so we got the hell out of there. But, uh, yeah, there's, I've never seen anything supernatural. I grant you, there was a few times like when we were attacked that I wasn't in my right mind. They could have been, you know, dancing around a Ouija board out there. I, I have no idea. But uh, I wasn't, uh, yeah, I, I was in terror, terror mode. Well, I'd, uh, I don't blame you. I probably would have been, you know, ready to shoot my way back to the boat, too. Um, that, again, well, I, that's the thing. I didn't want to shoot. I, it was auto, I, and, you know, I had hundreds of rounds at my disposal. I, I could have kept shooting, I, but I chose not to. I, I wanted nothing, nothing to do with that night. Not a single thing. Um, it, it was just something within me told me this, this isn't something you're going to win. Uh, it's really hard to explain. Uh, yeah, I, I just want people to be aware that it, it gets it gets ugly out there. And I, I, I mean, I wish I hear people telling their experiences and they're very believable you know about gifting and some other stuff going on and, and it's like well we don't get that up here it, it, i think it's the isolation uh 
and they're, they're just damn mean. It's like everything up there wants to kill you. Well, that seems to be the farther north you get, the more likely that they want to eat, eat you anyway. Well, yeah, a female moose, though, she don't want to eat you, but she'll stomp you to death, you know. So if I momentarily get quiet, like I said, I'm driving. I, I'm not trying to ignore you guys. No problem at all. Hey, uh, would you uh, like to tell us a little bit about your, your project, the Harry Man Project? Uh, yeah, I'm reaching out to people to uh, get them to share either privately, you know, uh, whether they want to be part of the documentary. But I'm trying to compile a database uh, where uh, certain things are happening, especially with the more violent encounters, like back at the Bristol Bay and whatnot. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get a database. So even if people don't believe they hear a story, they got a place they could check to see if there was any activity there, you know. Um, 500 to 2,000 people go missing every year up here. It, it, something's going on. I, like I said, it's not all the hairy man, but there, there's definitely something going on. I don't, I, I know of the Alaska Triangle. I'm driving in it right now. Um, so, I, and I'm not, you know, we're not seeing UFOs every night and things like that. It's not, it, it gets eerie when you get out in the woods, but I guess it's easy to get complacent around civilized places, you know, even though we're in Alaska. But yeah, I, I, I haven't seen anything paranormal with them. Uh, just just the flesh and blood type stuff, nothing, nothing that stands out. That's been my experience too with everything I've ever observed and everything I've ever noticed. However, I won't I won't discount anyone's account when they say that they had something, exactly. like, something like that happen. Yeah. But just from personal experience, everything I've ever encountered or been able to document was just pure physical. Right. And like I said, I wasn't in my right mind for many hours, you know. They they could have been doing weird shit out the window that I wasn't paying attention to. Like just just a mop hitting the window, uh, man, when I tell you, uh, yeah, it, it was white knuckle. It, it was definitely really hard to just to sit there and that white light from the, that white gas little home and lantern, uh, it was worse than being in an interrogation room. One thing but I, I wasn't I've noticed, at that point in time. One thing I've noticed no, is, is some people talk about, uh, uh, seeing Bigfoot smile at them, uh, but uh, smiling in, in uh, among primate behavior is generally a sign of aggression. I don't know that yeah, I would want a thousand pound a thousand pound primate grinning at me because he's probably not thinking what I'm thinking. You know, if, you know, if it's smiling, it's it's probably not a friendly gesture. Right. Right. No, and I, I agree. You know, and that's one of the things. You know, uh, I'm not just some Yahoo that's just going to start popping shots because something spooked me. It, it wasn't that kind of thing. Uh, I'm a very disciplined shooter and hunter. Uh, one shot, one kill is my motto, you know, the way we were raised. Because like I said before, you don't want to shoot a moose and have it run off because then it gets adrenalized, the meat stuff. You cook it for eight hours and shoot it for 12. You don't want that shit. But, uh, <laughs> so, there's so many variables to this. That's, that's another thing, you know. That's why when I left the comments the other night or last week about there are no experts, and, and I, there's just not, you know. There's people with definitely got some knowledge, you know. They've been out there, you know, collecting evidence and doing their thing. And hey, more power to them. It's just there are no no experts in this, and you know, of course, the TV shows are oh, experts and this and that. Okay, so. I think there's a lot of people that have some good stuff that are scared to come forward and share it, or they allow their ego to dictate, well, I'm the one that found it. What they find isn't good enough. What I find is better, you know, and that kind of mentality in the community. Exactly. And we don't, we really uh, don't I, need that in this, in this field because no. all we have is theory. 
Uh, yeah. Nobody's, nobody's yeah. an expert, and uh, anybody that claims otherwise is selling you something. Uh, you know, everybody, all, right. all we've got is theory. And you know, yeah. we, we study these behaviors, we study these encounter stories, and we learn little bits of information with each one. And then we start looking for the similarities in these stories, and that's how we can start predicting behavior. But we can't do that if we're just discounting you know, 60% of the stories because they don't agree with our narrative. Right, exactly. And I'm, you know, I've seen UFO activity. I've seen bright lights I can't explain. I've seen orbs out in the woods. I've just never seen any of them together, you know. Uh, well, the orbs we saw a couple hours before a UFO, but never with the hairy man involved. So I couldn't say, oh, we saw a bright light, saw a UFO, and then the hairy man tried to get us. You know what I mean? So yeah, I have no reference for that anyway. Well, Bill, Bill Sloan in the audience had a comment for you. He said, Fred, I know you can't see this because you're driving, but I wanted to thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Oh, yeah, no problem, man. Uh, the more people know, and I, I don't care if anyone believes me, they don't have to, you know, but I guarantee you, if, if you go on an expedition, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, Alaska's different. I, I don't know why, what makes them so aggressive that they come in on you like that. Like I, I've been trying to tell people there's that uh, metal detecting channel, TP6, something like that. He's a dentist in Fairbanks, but he does a metal detecting YouTube channel. He has a, a little 10 minute Bigfoot footage that he captured, uh, captured from over the years with like footprints. And uh, the last part of his video is one of these things screaming at him off in the distance and it starts throwing rocks at him. And that's a perfect example of what I'm saying. If they are around, they are going to make themselves known, and they're going to let you know directly. Yeah. If you, uh, if you, if you can find a link to that video, if you could e send me to that in my email, I would love to check that video out. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah, that that would be fantastic. Um, you said uh, that there were a lot of other stories in your area. Do you have any others you could share with us? Um, yeah, actually, this, this one, it, it's comical in the sense that uh, it was trying to get someone's ice cream, but uh, it's it for the guy's little store up on, uh, it's called Portage Creek, excuse me. I ate a big spaghetti dinner a little while ago, so I'm, it, anyway, I digress. Uh, it's called Portage Creek, it's on the Nishigak River, the East Channel, if, if you look on a map on the Nishigak River from Nishigak Bay, Portage Creek, you can't miss it. A little little dinky village, very very like maybe a handful of year-round residents. Um, years ago, an old timer he would get uh, big tubs, you know, five-gallon tubs of ice cream to sell, you know, periodically as cones and stuff for everyone who would be coming through either by dog sled or snow machine. Well, one season he was doing his first or second season doing that. Uh, this had to have been back in the 40s, I believe. Uh, is, well, they never lost it because everyone knew each other, you know? So he noticed that ice cream kept coming up missing a day or two after he'd get his order. So he put a, uh, a padlock on the door, and the very next day after his ice cream order made it in, because back then, get anything. Logistically speaking, it still is a major pain in the ass to get something to Bush, Alaska. So he was really uh, protective of his ice cream stash, which I understand. He probably paid a small fortune for it. But uh, so next time it happened, doors ripped off. So now he thinks it's, it's some drunk kids or something. And he starts setting up little booby traps. Well, come to find out, you know, uh, this thing didn't care about the booby trap. Uh, he got to the point to where he ended up staying the night in there just to, he would hear the, they would hear the screaming, but no one would come outside. Like I said, we didn't have a culture of seeking these things out. You know, you always stayed in cover when they were around. So no one would do anything when the screaming was going on. So he finally got the nerve up to spend the night, guard his ice cream. And this thing came in on him and damn near tore the roof off the place, uh, broke the door. 
if it wasn't for two of the nearby neighbors uh, putting shots on it as, as many shots as he was, because according to him, they, they lit it up, you know, and it just ended up running off or whatever. But it's things like that, you know, like the poor berry pickers, you know, I, I know personal family members and extended family members and friends that I know they saw what I saw. I know I, they were right there with me. We all were together collectively at these things. You know, even those people they, they don't acknowledge that stuff. But it, it's things, things like that, and screaming at the tree line, breaking stuff. Um, the biggest thing is how they'll they'll come in on you. Uh, I know I keep kicking it to that, but it, it's it's legit, man. They they will come in on you. Like when they were hooting like owls. That that was some creepy shit because the the initial owl hoot I heard it was all natural it, it it was very clear and natural it didn't sound out of whack but the responding one up behind us that that changed everything because this was not not quite a year after the initial uh, attack on the vehicle and here here we go again they're coming in on us and I mean with twenty twenty eight hindsight and all the talk of me and Mark, that that bothers me because if that is true, then uh, you know, and not just coincidental, like they sent me or something crazy and coming after me. That that thought creeps me out because, like, like we're talking, no one's an expert. You know, what if they talk amongst each other? You know, every fall and it just so happens they know that guy Fred from Dillingham. Yeah, he shot Earl, and uh, we're getting, you know what I mean? Who knows, you know? You, I might you have see this guy, get it. Up in the trees. Yeah, so, you know, they might be out to get me. There might be a reward of a couple rabbits or something. I don't know. <laughs> String or a fish? Yeah, something, you know. Ice cream. What? Yeah, they may get some ice cream as a reward. Who knows? Yeah, and, and you know when that old timer was telling us that story, we were on, we were on our way up to the Nuya Cup. We uh, we had to drop off an outboard for one of our relatives at Portage Creek because he was going to need it when he came back down river from wherever he was. So we left it for him there. He tells us that story down on the beach at the landing and. Uh, within a couple of days we're being attacked, you know? So yeah. it's just a history of nothing good. I mean, look at the Fort Chatham mystery, you know? It, it didn't have uh, the natives left overnight and the others kind of filtered out economically speaking over a brief period of time because there's no one left, you know? <laughs> yeah, the Port but Chatham no story is one that just fascinates me. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of people that live there during that time that are still around uh or, you know some of their relatives younger relatives that were there at the time as well well they're getting older now but they're you know they're down still Tobia, home places like this. they we just don't keep the records like the white do it's not a racing it's just uh we have more of an oral history like uh times when i was young when they would be telling us stories, you know, and, and mythology of any kind, which uh, we had had a little wood knife with uh, little little pictorials and grids on them, whether it be a seal or a moose or a bear or whatever. But they would draw in the dirt, you know, and make little mounds for mountains and that that type of thing. And that that we didn't have any kind of you know animal pelts or any shit like that. Sorry, I'm driving. Yeah, I think there's a lot of them on like so that. If I pause it, quiet. Yeah, yeah, there's a, you know, and I've been reaching out like crazy to people that I know. <clears throat> you know, I know they're there. You know, I know I've been trying to help them in. Hey, Yeah. 
recording. Fred, you're breaking up pretty bad. These are people I can look them in their eye and say, hey, I know you were there. You know what I'm If it drops, yeah. give me a minute. I'll get right back to you. I'm hitting a dead spot. So if, if it drops, just okay. because I get past the dead spot on the way out, I'll reconnect if it drops. Yeah, okay. the, the, the uh, Indians over here in Florida, the Miccosukee and Seminole, they're very, very, they don't like talking about it. They don't bring it up. You, <clears throat> um, it's like pulling teeth with them to get something, you know, even to mention about it. Um, when I used to hog hunt a lot, I mean, I hunted with a guy that, well, a kid my age, now he's probably my age, but he was a, a Seminole Indian. Talk to me because we were friends, but his grandfather and father, no way, no way. They don't want anybody knowing what's going on out there. What's what's they and they know it's out there, just like yeah. you know. So, I think we lost them. I think Fred froze up. Yeah, Doc, you sound sick, man. You're right. Yeah, I got a freaking cold again. So just uh, too many days on the road and too many, too many flights and being not drinking enough whiskey, one. not drinking enough whiskey. I tried to kill it the other night, but I didn't know. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't work. You know, something it Fred, yeah. Yeah. Um, some Fred was alluding to about the uh, about how the folks that were with him didn't talk about it. That's a common thing, man, with PTSD. Some folks yes. will not will not talk about it. And I mean, I'm, I know I'm getting to the medical side of it, but I mean, I think that's a very, very relevant facet to it. Mm -hmm. Is it when, because the last show when Fred was on DA, you remember we were talking to him and he said, this is his therapy. Yeah. You right. know, talking about it and the people who tend to push it down like that, you know, um, they, uh, they, they, uh, especially in that, in that close knit tribal unit that they have up there, and that's that's just one thing they don't talk about it, but it, you guys uh, hear me at all? Do, definitely doesn't, definitely doesn't yeah. help their PTSD. Yeah, man. You know, yeah. I'm trying to get out of that spot. If you guys can hear me, yeah, you froze up there for a minute or two. <clears throat> yeah, I'm probably gonna signal like bear with me, and it'll clear up once I get to a uh, less dead spot. I'm out by a place called Jim Creek, out by the Kinnick uh, Kinnick River, not too far from the Kinnick Glacier. Well, if you see anything big, black, and hairy moving, try to get it on camera. Oh, I'm going to try to make it a hood ornament. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't say that I blame you there. Just don't don't disable your view and be stuck there with it. You'll see him on the camera coming through the window right next right, to him. At least I just turned the camera. Yeah. Try and get a selfie with it. That was the uh, conversation. <laughs> yeah, that would certainly change things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it would. Call Geico on that one and tell them what yeah. happened to the truck. Well, they wouldn't believe you. Just show them, just show them a screenshot. Mm -hmm. What is that? The State Farm commercial? All the State Farm commercials they have? I think we're losing him again. Yeah, I think you get that dead zone. Yeah, I don't think my insurance policy covers, you know, cryptid yeah. encounters. Yeah, right. I mean, I mean, even if you're, even if your your screenshot and your dash cam was this, <laughs> you know, I mean that that would yeah, be, right. That would be about it, you know. Yeah, but if you're if you're careful, the the footage alone might be more than enough to replace your car. There you could go. Did you see? Could you see the insurance adjuster looking at that? Like, what the <laughs> hell? Is, what is that? You know, like DA said, but I, I agree, man. You, you'd probably have your own Discovery Channel special oh, yeah. or Travel Channel special or something. You'd have new trucks, everything. <clears throat> hey, everything. The day I ran over the Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. The Sam Squanch. I'll tell you. Be, uh, quite the distinction. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of stories that involve vehicles. Uh, there are stories of people that would, there was, in fact, the one that wasn't that long ago that I read about a young lady that was sitting at a stop sign. Uh, waiting to, to go in traffic and it reached like down and slapped the uh, windshield of her car and uh, was like trying to trying to shake the car to get in and she punched it and took off. 
Uh, and then there's other stories. There was one, uh, I think it was down in Arkansas, where the girl stopped at a gate and it reached in through the sunroof of her car and tried to grab her. Oh, yeah, I've seen that one. Yeah, I think I would have crashed through the gate if it had yeah. been me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lene. Thank you. Uh, and that, and that's, the, that's the thing about it. I mean, you think about if somebody hits one of these critters, they're not exactly little. And I've seen damage that moose do to vehicles, mm -hmm. you know, that moose do to cars. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's killed people. It's killed people, you know, flying through the windshield and whatever. Uh, oh, so even deer. Yeah. Even deer, the deer man. Absolutely. You hit, you hit a big animal, it's going to do a lot of damage. Oh, yeah. To All right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, good, good. Yeah, uh, there was another time this in 94, 1994. Um, I had just, uh, it was the first time I got married. Um, it was like two days later. We were prepping to go. Uh, our honeymoon was going to be a camping trip. But as we were getting ready, the rental house I was renting from a, a relative there in Dillingham, uh, not too far from the, uh, the airport there in town, we were standing there talking and we were discussing where we were going to go. And as we were talking, it was me, uh, my first wife, her name was Amy and my buddy Rudy, I went to uh, high school with briefly down in Seattle. Uh, we're all standing in the living room area talking about where we we're going to go and stuff. And we heard walking on the roof. Now, this, this was a one sided roof probably a 312 pitch, just enough to keep stuff split off of it. it was, still had to shovel it off in the winter, but it, it had a little smoke to it. So as we're standing there talking and we heard the footsteps, we immediately, you know, we grab some guns and we go to go outside to see what's going on. And we saw nothing on the, the roof of this little house. This was a small rental. It wasn't very big. We saw nothing but about 20 yards away, the trees were moving, so this thing had to have jumped or got up in one of the trees and was going from tree to tree, so something for people to think about, look up. Uh, they'll travel like that, too. Look up. You never know. You know, they, you may have heard a, a twig crack over there, but that doesn't mean that's exactly where they're at once you try to get your eyes on them. They could already be Gosh, they move so fast, man. Uh, you know, uh, some things I've noticed that I wanted to share as well is a lot. I've noticed a lot of people they'll go right down a main game trail and and look for tracks there. But you're not gonna barely, rarely buy a track like that. Maybe crossing. What you want to do is look, you know, 10 to 15 yards to either side of that game trail. And if you're in an area with these things, there's gonna be a secondary game trail that. Yeah, there's going to be all sorts of sign on of these things. So, so just people keep that in mind when you're out there looking. If you're on a game trail, it, it, that may be the, the victim trail. Yeah. Um, so just, just be aware of that. I, I haven't heard anyone mention that, but I've, I've noticed that. Um, a few of the areas where we've had them scream at us and run off, they weren't on the immediate game trail, but they were on a game trail adjacent to it that you wouldn't see because of the berry bushes and stuff like that. So that's yeah. something to think about for, for people going out there. Yeah, it's definitely worth thinking about. Uh, you're not the first person to mention them using treetops. Um, I've heard that several times from people talking about the, about them going up into the trees. Um, and in some of the cases where people were tracking them, they said that the, the tracks just seemed to disappear. Uh, yeah. Even in a clearing. Um, to me, that would indicate they're backtracking on their own tracks and then going up a tree. And that's a great way to throw off yeah. the pursuit if so you know something's following you. Well, these things can jump, too. Uh, uh, yeah, they can jump. I've, I've, uh, I did an interview the other day with a, a bush pilot. He flies out privately to check his trap line. And he goes out about every four to five days, maybe once a week, depending on weather. And uh, they spotted one. It was the first time he had uh, taken his dad with him. Because, uh, this is a younger bush pilot. Um, so anyway, he had, it was the first time he took his dad. His dad was flying back, seat in the little Piper Cub. 
And as they were going past uh, some of the top Keaton mountains, just north of me here, uh, they noticed something moving. And uh, from the air, it looked like the back of a moose was like a deformity. Uh, they thought it was a cow moose because there was no antlers. It was just a big body, dark thing, kind of weirdly moving through the trees. So it, it threw him off enough to where he circled around and came back at a lower altitude. And as they were coming up on it, they were coming up to a, we have a lot of draws that kick back up into the mountains here, uh, like little small valleys. And some of them are really uh, sheer drops on them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it kind of reminds me of a fjord, but with more trees. Anyway, so it was that kind of terrain. And this thing, uh, when it realized that they were essentially following it, it took off running and cleared in a, a sprinting jump. Uh, it had to have been a 35 or 30, 35 foot wide little crevasse, he said, because uh, later on that year it happened, they went to that spot hiking because he marked it on his little plotter on his GPS. And uh, it, it took two days to hike back in where, at, where they saw that, but they, they, they estimated 30, 35 foot one leap. So if they want to, they could jump. That's a heck of a jump. Man. Yeah, yeah. He couldn't make out the overall height of it, though, because uh, as they were trying to spot it, it was like it, it could hide just enough where they, it would start moving again once they thought, but once it thought, they, you know, the people in the plane couldn't see it. And that's another thing. Um, I've heard it said before somewhere, but uh, if, if you're being paralleled in the trees, and, and you're walking and whatnot, a lot of people say they stop real quick to see if it continues. Do that, but also look around, because you may see it, you know, going from cover to cover, and just just things popping in my head I'd like to share just so people can... It, it may have been discussed somewhere else, I'm not sure, but... Well, that's one thing we definitely like to share with our audience because if anybody's going to go out, be they looking for a cryptid or doing anything, you know, hunting, hiking, you know, you, we want people to be safe. We want them to come back safely. Yeah. Right. And they could take everything I say with a grain of salt. I don't, I don't care if they believe me. Just, just hear what I'm saying. And if you happen to walk into some circumstances that sound vaguely familiar to what I'm talking about, maybe, maybe pay attention. Yeah. Sorry, I'm crossing the Matanuska River right now. I just went over a, a bridge, so no problem. Some of the some of the people up here don't know how to drive. And the... <laughs> <laughs> you get you should come to to where I live. You get more than two snowflakes in the air, and everybody in this city forgets how to drive. Yeah, it's it, amazing. It snowed once when I lived in of... Seattle. The the whole damn city shut down. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I was out driving around in my Honda like, what are you guys doing? There's nothing wrong here. Yeah. Yeah, I was just in Seattle last weekend, uh, Fred. I think everybody out there drives with their eyes closed. I don't know. Yeah, and the, the way I-5 was designed there, right into town, if you're coming from like West Seattle heading to North Seattle, it just bottleneck. Yep. It, it's a horrible place. Beautiful. I used to love it there, but not anymore. It's a hellhole nowadays. Yeah. But uh, uh, back back to sharing experiences from from Bristol Bay. Uh, <coughs> there was uh, back in '83. I, I think I shared this with uh, William Jennings. Uh, in 1983, <coughs> we were coming back from Moose Camp, and we had uh, one of my uncles had a brand new fishing boat, an American Commercial. And it's a 32 foot long. And uh, on the stern of the fishing boat, the reel, the big hydraulic reel was taken off, and we had uh, some two by four material up and a tarp to TP over it. So we had a place to hang our moose meat, and we were using the, the fishing boat as our bait camp, and we would use the skiff to go check out blues or whatever. Well, we were on our way back from, from hunting camp, and we had a couple of moose hanging up on the rack and quarters and uh, we, uh, we were getting to, toward the mouth of the Michigan River by Black Bluff and Angel Bay and that's a tidal zone and so if you're not 
right in the channel, you run the risk of going dry until the tide comes back in to float you again. Well, that happened to us, and we had a bunch of extra weight on there with the moose, extra fuel and stuff. So uh, the skip we were towing, uh, one of my older cousins said, hey, let me take, you know, the younger kids, get them out of everyone's hair and take them sport fishing, you know, rod and reel. So we all load up. There's about six of us all together, uh, four of us a lot younger, two, you know, around 16-ish. Uh, as far as the younger ones go, and then there was three adults. There was my dad uh, and two of my uncles. So <laughs> we jump in the skiff and we push off, and we're backing away from the the boat. And as we're doing it, uh, I know my uncles are screaming and yelling at us, you know. So my older cousin puts us back in the uh, forward, and we come back up to the boat. And we notice there's flashing going on around us. And then we heard the scream. There's a hairy man up on the bluff. And we could only see it silhouette. Cause, and that's another thing. At dusk, or, or just right as it's getting dark, these things really, really like to uh, put on a show, at least up here. Uh, they seem to be more active at that time anyway. So anyway, we hear the screaming and stuff, but we're still a little, we, we're aware of the hairy man, but this is our first, like, loud and live like that uh, on that intensity level you know it was it was pretty intense it was like a 65 foot high bluff and i mean in the big scheme of things it wasn't that far away it, it really yeah. wasn't and so we get we all get shuffled on there and put inside the cabin and we're all initially sitting up top uh inside the uh where the little kitchen area is and there's a little table and stuff for the captain's seat and initially we're sitting there and we're kids we're laughing like oh, you know the hairy man screaming it, it was whatever to us you know because it, it was real but it, it hadn't real I guess so as we're sitting there kind of giggling around trying to look out the window to see if we can watch it or whatever we're getting yelled at to keep our heads down because this thing is throwing rocks and one of the rocks uh, it started throwing bigger rocks, and one of the rocks went through the tarp and knocked off one of the quarters of meat uh, that were hanging on the pole. And that, that's when they started shooting at it. Uh, yeah, n never a good experience, man. Never. Uh, Do you think maybe like they smelled the moose meat? <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if it just so happened we were there. It were there it was going to tell us about it because that that's entirely possible too you know it yeah. could just have been they move around more in the fall that's when we're out there more it, you know there, there's variables to it so uh i just i don't trust them i, I don't blame you i know i've read a lot of a lot of encounters where people have discovered animals that have been killed by them and the first thing that is eaten is uh, a lot of the internal organs. And I know when you start yeah. dealing with the liver and the kidneys and the heart, there are an incredible amount of nutrients in those organs. And I completely understand why they go for those first, because if you're surviving in a cold weather environment, the nutrients provided by those organs alone will keep you keep your, uh, your body temperature up and keep you healthy for a good long while. Yeah, well, the salmon up here, they're, they're fat layers that are under the skin. So mm -hmm. bears will just, when they're, they're plentiful in the river, the bears will just tear the skin off and eat fatty skin and leave the rest of the carcass for the eagles and stuff, you know. So, yeah, every animal up here does that in essence. You know, get the most nutritious parts and, and mm -hmm. gorge on that first. Uh, there's just there's so much going on with it that. Like, I know this documentary is not going to just be a single part because it's take too big. To, just the two places I'm going to initially, you know, I'm looking at, geez, uh, there's going to be some hiking involved. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's not going to be a, not going to be an easy trip. But I'm sure, you know, who knows, that maybe I'll get some of the best footage and, you know, make something good of it. I don't know. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because they're they are all over. I think those who have had things like uh, those kind of experiences when they felt that primal um, 
that trigger, I guess. Because I, I think everyone has that primal fear that I'm talking about. It's just mm-hmm. not uh, acknowledged anymore. We're too civilized to, to worry about that. But I believe we all have a primal fear that once it's triggered, we're, we more, uh, we're more susceptible to remembering it and like, subconsciously picking up on it. That's why I think people who have had encounters are more likely to have another encounter because whether they realize it or not, subconsciously they picked up on what it felt like the first time just before it happened. And so, you know, kind of like the mind grabs onto that. Well, I've also noticed that the more you open yourself up to a subject, the more you notice it. Uh, you, know, you become far more yeah. observant to certain things once you, you know, your mind has accepted that they're real. Um, oh, yeah. It, yeah, for sure. It, kind of like a, like a, seeing a ghost. You know, a lot of people are skeptical about seeing a ghost, but the first time they see one, they start noticing more and more things. Uh, and it's the same way with cryptids. I mean, it's just all about what you what you train your mind to look for, uh, be that conscious right. or subconsciously. I mean, I, I was yeah. skeptic. Yeah. I mean, look, look at going deer hunting. I mean, the first time you go deer hunting as a kid, you know, you don't see squat, but then you, you realize what you're looking for. What you're looking for is that movement. And once once you, yeah. you, you, you've, you've located on that movement, once you're, you've trained your mind, this is what I'm looking for. It becomes a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think biologically, too, as humans, you know, if you've experienced something like that, it almost kind of fine tunes that that uh, that primal you know that sixth sense that we talk about you know it, it yeah, for you sure. to, to pay more attention to the environment you're in you know you you pick up on hey there's no no animal sounds things like that and you can actually sense it's almost like if, if you're sitting there at, at, a, at a restaurant or something and you feel somebody looking at you you know that type of thing yeah it, it, yeah and, for sure and, and, and you you get more attuned to that especially after you have been exposed to it right yeah, and and that's something I noticed too. Uh, there's, oh, I mean, I've been aware of these things since I was a little kid. Uh, being warned, you know, don't turn your back on the woods; they'll they'll snatch you up and and take you away in a basket and eat you. Uh, even being aware of it and and having a, a knowledge of them and seeing them in the distance and stuff every once in a while. And I don't want it to sound like every time I go outside in the woods here, something's screaming at me and I'm having an encounter. That's not it. Uh, there's, there's, it's hard to explain. I'm trying to find the words here. Um, it's like knowing something without knowing it. Uh, not an ESP thing or anything. I, I think everyone has it. It's similar to that unlocking that, uh, primal fear but once it's unlocked to a certain degree you you get this knowing by almost like a uh, I, I couldn't say it was like a special brain power i think we all have it but you become aware like uh, uh, going up river for example there's areas that you just sense there's no good in that area uh, yeah I've, I've and been most in areas time, like that. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, no one has to explain to you that it's bad, right? You, right. you get that feeling. It's like, oh, shit, I don't want to be here. It's spidey it's sense. Thing. You got your spidey exactly. sense. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, but times that by 10. And mm-hmm. when it comes to these big ones up here, uh, they, I don't know how they project that fear. Uh, it could be incapacitating, like, Ah, jeez. There's so many unanswered questions. So, it's, you know, it's all speculation until we can prove something. Yeah. I remember one time I was deer hunting up near Richland, Missouri, on a friend's land. And he told me, he said, stick to the south side of the of the property. He had about, a, about 170 acres. He said, stick to the south side of the property because it gets really thick and, and dense up toward the north end. I said, okay. So I was I was in an area and I kept in an area and I kept not seeing anything, but I would hear stuff farther to the north of me. So I kind of backtracked up this little ravine and found myself in a like a narrow ravine that went underneath a bluff. And I wasn't maybe a hundred yards up that ravine when everything just went dead quiet. And I was like, 
I don't need to be in here. I really, mm. really don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just had the feeling that I was not welcome there. I didn't hear or see anything. You know, nothing, <laughs> nothing screamed at me. Nothing stepped out. I didn't see any tracks. I just had that primitive instinct feeling like you really don't need to be here right now. It's like being in when yeah. you're on the a deputy, you know, it's the same, that same gut feeling mm -hmm. when you pull somebody over or, you know, just, you, you, I know what you're saying, man. I get you. I believe you. I know. Yeah. Hey, if you guys can uh, forgive me for a second, I got to, I got to run in somewhere real quick. I'm not going to uh, just connect or anything because I don't know if I'll get signal again, but I'll okay. be right back. Not a problem. Yeah, uh, so DA, I had a, uh, a student in my class up in Seattle area uh, tell me about one of his encounters. Really? What was it? Uh, nice. He and his he and his girlfriend were out camping up in the hills. I don't know somewhere out in the out in the in the Washington State area, and uh, they uh, had their dog with them, and they were out camping, and they had been doing some target shooting and stuff like that, uh, and uh, he said. Uh, they had they had getting ready for you know to eat dinner or something and he said he heard like the woods went quiet and he said and the dog started growling and hackles went up and then it started whining the tail went between his legs dog started pissing all over himself and then they started hearing calls they heard a call in front and then they heard a, a echo call behind them and he said it was probably a couple of hundred yards away uh, and then he heard something like a little a, a, a higher pitch call which he thinks now is like what was a juvenile. Yeah. Uh, and, and so he kept hearing the echoing calls and they just kept getting closer and closer to their position. And he said he doesn't know what turned them around, anything like that. He didn't see anything, didn't smell anything, but he said the calls stopped. He said, but they, they did get rocks and branches and stuff tossed at them pretty much all night. And he said like three o'clock in the morning, they're like, you know, look at my watch. It's screw this crap o'clock and we're <laughs> yeah. out of here. And, and so he said they never went back to that area again, but he was, he was pretty, uh, he said, I was pretty shook up about it for a while. Didn't talk to anybody about it for a while. He said, but I was telling everybody about the show and maybe we got some, maybe we'll have some, uh, some new subscribers, but he was, uh, he said, yeah, that was one of a couple that I've had out there. And he said, and it's not, I'm, I'm not the first one to have that similar type of uh, encounter. Yeah, those the, the stories of campers uh, being harassed and hunters being harassed, those are fairly commonplace. Uh, and it, it seems like we're starting to hear more and more of them because people have, um, I don't want to say there's, there's, there's a uh, more of an open policy, but with social media and all the television shows that we've got about cryptids, people feel more comfortable coming forward. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, Bigfoot's trying to break into Fred's car. I know. Man. <laughs> Holy crap. And he's probably knocking snow off of it. He said he was in a <laughs> snowstorm. Yeah. There he is. Uh, just one thing I want to remind everybody, if you guys are new to the show, hit that like and subscribe button. Don't forget to share the video with, with, with your friends that like this type of content. And down next to the Sorry, uh, like and subscribe, there's a little bell icon. If you hit that little bell icon, it'll let you know anytime we go live. And uh, we appreciate your, your, your support and helping us expand the, uh, the range of the channel and invite new people in. All right. Where were we? We were talking about uh, what, potential capabilities or something. <laughs> now, Fred, I got a question for you, man. Uh, yeah. Uh, having when, How long were you in Seattle? How long were you in Seattle area for? Uh, when I lived in Seattle, uh, I actually graduated Nathan Hale High School, North Seattle Lake City, back in 93. Okay. Um, we would live... Uh, my dad was an electrician back then, so we would move around wherever the big jobs were. But we would always come back in the summer for fishing and, and stay in the fall for hunting. Okay. Now, yeah, I got a question for you. And I know DA and we've talked about this on other shows, but do you find that the Pacific Northwest and all up through British Columbia into Alaska, do you find the further north you go, the more aggressive these, these critters get? That's what it seems to be. Yeah. Like, I've heard a mixed bag out of Washington, you know, um, heard of kind encounters uh, in Oregon. You hear you hear of encounters where they've helped people, you know, things of that nature. And honestly, I'm looking for someone with a good encounter up here. Uh, and I haven't, 
I haven't come across one. So um, there's a guy, uh, Thomas Seawood. He uh, he runs the uh, Sasquatch Island channel. He's uh, mm-hmm. the First Nations from uh, Vancouver and uh, uh, Vancouver Island there. And uh-huh. uh, he, he had mentioned something about the longitudinal or latitudinal line, something or another. Uh, we didn't have a chance to kind of flesh out the theory, but it has to do with uh, along this particular uh, latitude line is where uh, a lot more aggressive behavior happens. And, uh, man, I wish we had had a chance before now to have a conversation about that because it intrigued me, uh, just the potential of that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I with, mean, with ley lines and things of that lay, nature. Is it, yeah, I was going to ask you, is that like a, yeah. like a ley line? Um, yeah, he, he had mentioned it, but I, I didn't. I didn't pick up what he was putting down. So to speak. Now, uh, and I'm wondering if there's any correlation between these, uh, these, uh, the Pacific Northwest and on up. Is it? Be- I mean, is it, is it because I've, I've heard that a lot of the other creatures, there's some creatures out there that are that are more. Uh, omnivorous and you got other ones that are more carnivorous and the more the more carnivorous they are the more aggressive they are is that something that would uh yeah uh, i mean our brown bears are our coastal brownies are omnivorous but a large portion of their diet is protein and you know some berries and whatnot and some sweet grasses and, and some other little things but it's primarily um a heavy protein diet and i you know we got some very aggressive bears up here too uh but the thing that 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 gets me is the intelligence with these animals uh, i i've dealt with smart bears i i work bear control and one of the reasons these bears were chosen to be put down is because they were smart they knew how to get into places and, and cause trouble so mm-hmm. you know speaking of something that size bigger on top of that, with intelligence beyond, you know, that of a problem bear, let's say, the, the potential for, gosh. You yeah, know. I mean, because you're, you're talking a, a sentient being, you know, at that yeah, point. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, self-aware. Yeah, um, for sure. Bears aren't self-aware until you shoot them. And then they, <laughs> then they realize, <laughs> then they realize, oh, oh, yeah. sorry, I'm. I'm a smart ass sometimes, but yeah, so I think it has to do with, this. you know, we have our, our spring doesn't start till the end of April, beginning of May. Mm-hmm. It's almost, you know, for all the trees that have leaves on them, you're, you're looking at mid May. And that's down here in the lower altitude. You know, you get up into them out, out, alpine meadows, excuse me. You know, you may have snow up there until the middle of July. Right. Uh, so I, I think it has a lot to do with the isolation and with the, there's a lot of resources, but like with our caribou and stuff, they migrate around and moose, you know, wherever they drop from mom, they don't leave a, a 10 mile radius of wherever they drop. So things like that. So the, their food could move around, uh, competition for that food, you know, for all I know, we came up there when they were getting ready to bear hunt, and we messed it up for them. But again, it's all speculation because there's no. I didn't stick around to investigate. You know, someone said uh, there was a comment. Uh, someone asked, "Well, in 2006, there was digital cameras. Why didn't you take a picture?" Well, that's not in our culture. You know, that'd be like uh, me going to the airport and getting photos. You know, for postcards from Alaska. We just what for we go out the door it's all right there you know right right uh, so it, it's never been in our culture so it, stretching out to do this documentary um it's going to be different because i've never had to look for them they've always uh made themselves aware because uh, like the bristol bay area they're, they're there they're just there um uh, grant you in different places most of the time but there's at least two places i know of where there's always some kind of activity going on um whether it be winter time or not there's geez, you know just talking to less than a handful of elders i've i've learned a lot 
as far as exactly how uh, widespread sightings are, but just uh, on top of that, how leery they are to share. I, I brought up making the documentary with these elders, right? And I asked them, well, would you mind speaking on it? Well, we won't say your face, you know, we won't say your name, just, just share some of these stories in your own voice. And then, they end up, none of the elders really want to do that, you know. They, uh, and like you said, that's a cultural thing, man. And, you know, yeah. it, it, and like, you know, somebody, you know, somebody says, well, why weren't you taking a picture of it with your digital camera? I mean, taking, taking film of one, you know, vi- footage of one from afar is way different than somebody knocking your freaking cabin off the foundation. You got, you yeah. got more pressing yeah. concerns at the moment than, hey, let me get a selfie with this big hairy bastard, you know? So, <laughs> right. Trying to post to Instagram or something. Yeah. Hashtag uh, Bigfoot. I- you know, I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's, kind of, that's kind of the last thing on your mind at, at, at that moment. It's more survival than than selfie time. Yeah, you, you want to avoid, you know, having to having to be Little Spoon at that point. Yeah. Hey, get, what, right. What, what, well, when I made eye contact, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say when I made eye contact with the one, uh, I wasn't even thinking about shooting. It just happened. You know what I mean? So, uh, the thought of looking for a camera or anything of that nature is just i understand where they're coming from if you had the opportunity and the capability why didn't you but it wasn't that kind of party uh yeah well that's why you're doing it was life and death that's why you're doing a documentary you know and that that situation they'll be shooting but not with a camera you know in the documentary you're shooting with with film you know so yeah um, exactly and that's 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 a that's completely understandable. I think if anybody were in your shoes, they would probably do the same thing. Well, I know uh, about I back in, so. back last July when I was in LBL with Nick Valente, uh, I had my cell phone in my hand, want, wanting to film something, and we're driving down this narrow gravel road coming out of Demumbers Bay, and. I look over to my right and I saw something large, black, and looked like a dog man sticking up behind a tree. And I had my cell phone in my hand and it never occurred to me to film it. I was right. like, stop, there it is. And I, 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 I got out of the got out of the got out of the truck. I mean, I'm still looking looking for it. The cell phone in my hand is completely forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, because you're so in mud those, sucked on it at the moment. moment. That's the last thing. Yeah, as we're getting back to the truck, yeah. because you get it on film, I'm like, oh, 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 shit, I had it in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't even think yeah, they, they have that ability to grab your attention, no matter what kind of cryptid it may be. It gets your attention in the moment. Yeah. <clears throat> Everything else is like, holy shit, what is that? Even when you know what it is, it's still, what the hell is that? Like, ah. Uh, like am making I eye contact what, am I, with that thing? Am, am I seeing Man. what I think I'm seeing? It's it's probably so surreal that it takes a minute yeah. for your brain to register. Yeah, you're actually seeing this. This is really happening. So, right. Well, within two seconds, within two seconds of that one uh, making eye contact in the window, I was shooting. Uh, within two seconds, made eye contact, and it was all said in that look in the eyes. Um, just how they were. Uh, like the clear black glass marble there was no whites or nothing but what stands out most is the amount of eye shine um, uh, it, it's almost like it's pupil kind of uh, regulated how big or bright the, the reflection was if mm-hmm. that makes sense mm-hmm. but yeah it was all said in that look in that moment and there was I, I'm just glad I didn't fold because I think me shooting changed how they they yeah. interacted with us. Yeah. Uh, that well, Fred, you said that when it threw that rock at you, if you hadn't taken an extra step back, it would have hit you in the head. Do you think that, yeah. that they were legitimately hunting you guys? Yes, uh, I do. Uh, and I, I say that after many, trust me, many hours of, of contemplating it. So here, here's how I view that whole thing. They they made us down to lure us out. Mm-hmm. Um, we were lured out, but we spotted the the play on the field, so to speak. Yeah. We went back inside. 
he saw it. It showed its teeth to him. He went under the table and uh, it came up closer to the window before we looked over because he, he never took his eyes off it. But uh, so it came in closer. I shot at it as it was moving away. Um, geez, there's just so many, so many things. So I think shooting at it as it was moving away changed how they, they were going to do it because everything they did after that was to check a reaction. Like it was the first reaction they got, I was shooting. The second reaction, we did nothing. Uh, the third, you know, when they're throwing the rocks, we didn't do anything. We honestly inside me, I kept waiting for them to come and just smash the hell out of that place and beat me against a tree. Uh, I, that was, uh, I, I, I killed myself mentally like 10 different ways, you know, anywhere from being quartered by each one grabbing a limb and ripping me apart to, you know, getting smashed with something. It, it's not a happy feeling when you're, uh, you're literally in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And, and you ain't the top of the food chain anymore. <laughs> no, these, you know, yeah. my family members I was with, you know, especially my, my younger relative, my cousin, he was with me back up gunning with a big 800 plus pound style coastal brown bear. He didn't flinch. He didn't, there was no waving of any kind. There was no form of cowardice or, or anything of that nature. Uh, that particular uncle, he's on the walrus commission. We went to round Island with the federal permission and went and shot walrus while 2000 pound walrus were blubbering on down the beach. As a matter of fact, that same 30 odd six kills walrus. You know, it, there's just those unanswered questions that really bother me. Um, yeah. Now, I got a question for you too, Fred. I, I can't remember. You, you probably said it, but I, I didn't catch that. What time of year was it? What time of year was Fall. it? So Fall. they were, I mean, they could be, I mean, if they're anything like other, other animals up there, they were looking for a food source ready to get, you know, get some, get some uh, extra fat on them for the winter possibly, you know? So, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, you, you were, you were, you were, they're opportunistic hunters, I believe, you know, and. Right. Or, like or it could have been else. mating season, you know, and we, yeah. you know, yeah. we messed up their move, you know, that pissed me off too. Um, but yeah, it, it seems like there's a correlation between the fall and uh, the, an uptick. It, no matter what time of year you run into them, they're aggressive, but it seems like in the fall, there's a, a different level to it because berry picking we do that in the fall you hear a lot of uh, stories about the berry pickers being accosted uh and, and them luring people out and ambushing them that's a from from the stories i'm hearing from people and, and stuff and a couple of the interviews i did that that's a running thing they, they will lure you hmm. and only by some happenstance it didn't work out in their in their way or whatever but yeah, that shows organized man. thought. I mean, tactics, tactics, you got to have organized, you know, thought, communication, whatever. <laughs> that um, look how much more aggressive grizzlies get just before hibernation. Absolutely. They're needing oh, to put yeah. on that extra weight for the winter. And I would say for a, a, a large carnivore, like a Bigfoot, if it doesn't hibernate, it's probably looking to do the same thing. It needs that extra weight for winter. Yep. Yeah. I I've, I've actually seen coastal brown bears so big and, pull up on salmon that their bellies were dragging huge well over a thousand pound bears and they would still run down uh, uh errant salmon in the creek if it looked like it was a meal you know what i mean um yeah yeah so the, i'm sure that drive is there i know that's the reason we're out there we're gathering resources berries moose fish yeah. um but it, I think it's isolation is why they are so different up here as far as their aggression level. You know, we don't have the population density. We got, what, less than a million people up here statewide? Yeah. Uh, or probably <clears throat> barely a half million, honestly. And they're all concentrated in Fairbanks, Anchorage, and Juneau, you know. Yeah, I read once about Alaska that if you took the entire population of Alaska and spread them out, you would have one person per every square mile and still not run out of land. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We could yeah. fit 19 other states in our state. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's a big uh, state. Yeah, and, it's probably and, like and, a, and that's part of the. Go ahead. I was, I was going to say, I mean, being aggressive like that. I mean, even when you get a deer in the rut, they they get, you know, they get like that. Yeah. They get, I mean, they get crazy. Um, yeah, that's that is bar fights, right? <laughs> <laughs> But but they yeah, were, they were discussing uh, in the chat talking about uh, why they'd be less likely to attack, just straight up try to attack somebody that was armed, because any large predator has to weigh the risk versus versus value of that meal. Now, is that meal worth the damage I'm going to take to get it? Uh, because there's no there's no Bigfoot clinic out in the middle of the woods. They can't just mm-hmm. probably go, hey, Doc, I need you to take a couple bullets out and stitch me up. Uh, even a small <laughs> one that can fester and get nasty. Right. So they don't want to. Yeah. They don't want to risk a bad yeah. injury for a small reward. Right. Yeah, and that see that that's another an, unanswered question. Why press us like the way they did? Um, they they had ample opportunity to end us. I mean, uh, in a multitude of ways, but they didn't move on it. Everything they did. It, it, it felt like we were being told and like they were feeding on the fear. Um, like when they were running around the place, right? And, and I heard that, that snipping sound. Uh, uh, that, that sound, anyway. But the, it's just the feeling, I, looking back on it, I didn't realize it in the moment because it was so terrifying, but there was like this, uh, this weird energy along with the pressure and, and I wish I wasn't so terrified in that moment I could better articulate what it was like because uh, it, it was very surreal it was like being stuck uh, like a like with blinders on it, such a focus with what you're looking at you see everything but like you particularly focus on just like pinpoint amount of space yeah, yeah. Uh, Lene Perkins with, uh, had a good question. Uh, Lene Perkins had a good question. She says, "There's is there any evidence one way or the other on whether the hairy man hibernates?" Uh, we've seen him in the winter. Um, we were snow machining up to Third Lake, up by um, I think it was Lake Beverly, and we were going up to go uh, high marking with our snow machines. That's where you go up as high as you can in the steepest spot so you can mark the highest, right? So we're heading back to do that, and we had some uh, family friends. We know they had a trap line out that way, and off in the distance, we were had to have been, gosh, when we initially saw this thing moving, we had to have been about a mile away. But you got to understand, in the winter time, a black hawk moving, you notice that movement. You know, we're all yeah. lifelong hunters; we pick up on that movement. So we figured it was one of the slosher boys. Oh, you know, they're over by their trap line. Well, let's buzz over there, see if they have any whiskey, say hi, and then go on about our way. Well, as we're cutting across the flat, high-end snow machine, um, this was in 95. Uh, two of us had uh, flare storms, 900 cc. Anyway, we were ripping across there, and as we got closer to pick up the trail, uh, it looked like someone wearing snow initially when we were pulling up on the on the track and by this point the tracks led right into the tree line and it we got uh we'd slow down and i asked my cousin spencer i was like are they avoiding us and then uh, we didn't put it together in the moment but then all of a sudden the screaming breaking um it snapped a birch tree uh was thrown and flinging stuff just inside the tree line and, and it was a hairy man so we mistook it or someone in snowshoes, you know, running in the snow or whatever. But it was winning. So, gosh, there's, I know there's a lot, a lot of caves out there in all those mountains, the Wood River Mountains. Um, gosh, we have so many mountain ranges up here. It's unreal. Uh, and all of them are, are big. So yeah. the, there's ample places for them to either have a, a home base, stay warm in the winter. Um, but like only uh, about a rough handful, maybe two of uh, encounters in the winter, but they're no less aggressive. Um, usually the ones in the winter is when they're at your window peeking in or trying to get into your stash of food. Well, they do say that they, 
I mean, they, they do go, I mean, in caves, and they've been commented that they do travel, supposedly, through cave systems. That's been oh, said, yeah. too. If you look at the missing 411 stories, That's, the I was just gonna bring it up. large disappearances are in and around cave systems. We see yeah. if I still got that yeah. map. Yeah, here it is. Yep. You know, the, yeah. the, the clusters of missing people correspond very closely to these major cave systems. You know, you know what, Fred? It, right. it did, and I don't, and I hate to do this, but if you go to and DA knows what I'm talking about because I did, I texted him last night about it. This one lady wrote into uh, um, Cam's show, um, Crypto. Um, Dixie what's Cryptid. Cam? Dixie Cryptid, and he and it's uh, a story that this lady wrote in, and um, it was. She was a uh, geologist, uh, did cave, a did geologist cave and she went into, into caves and she was with the team mm. and she was hired by the government. But she tells a detailed story. Um, if you get a chance to it, later really on listen to it, it'll blow your mind. It Talks really about will. Backpacks and guns and bones and children's bones and stuff. And it's wow. crazy. It, so, it's I funny mean, you bring that up. Um, yeah, I, I just. Uh, maybe two weeks ago heard of an encounter from back in the it had to have been around 1935 where they found a cave um, up by Lake Clark Pass by Lake Iliamna, Nondalt area just west of there uh, they found a cave with similar things uh, they found three different uh, sets of clothing that matched the, the Close. Relevant to that for sure. I, I, I don't want to look for those caves myself. I keep getting. I don't know what kind of spice to use, but I keep getting these little. I think it's the spice for the spaghetti or something. But, um, yeah, I, I don't mind those caves. I don't want. I, I do. I do, do but. Man, there's there's such a part of me that is like, you know what? I'm I just let me see one again. I'm gonna, you know, shoot it in the eye this time. <laughs> but the more reasonable side is like get get video footage that'll be far more helpful. Even though I, I I'm not holding a grudge, but I got a grudge. Yeah, I got a bone to pick. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um. I, I don't know. Yeah. I ju I just don't trust them. I have a real hard time with that. I, I didn't, uh, my, I can't my experience yeah. wasn't as bad as I mean I didn't have a bad experience like you. Um, I didn't believe in it, yeah. you know, but it it made me believe a lot, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, you know, and I I just want people to be forewarned. Hey, do what you're gonna do. If you're in a position where you can gift and trade, and you know, hey, it's awesome. I, I haven't seen it, right. uh, so I, you know, I don't, I don't want to cast aspersions on anyone. Uh, you know, hey, more power to you. Maybe they got the ticket to get more information for us, but uh, just where I am at here, I, I just there's no, there's no happy, no happy endings to any of the stories. No. Outside uh -uh. Of the people that uh -uh. experienced it got away, but nothing fruitful. Yeah, it's like they, they, everybody, you know, you, these people gifting them and leaving food for them, and no, oh, sorry, man. no, yeah, not me, I, yeah, no, I don't even bait bears. You know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a free spot and stock, free chase, you know, kind of guy. I, I, baiting something it seems unfair. You yes. know what I mean? And. Even though yeah. in the context of gifting, it's still a form of bait. You're baiting it in to get some kind of interaction. Same thing. Mm -hmm. in just different context. But, yeah, I, I think this community in a whole, as a whole, would do a lot better if uh, I, I've noticed, and I, I'm not going to say names or say anything like that, but I've noticed there's a lot of people that get very arrogant about what they think they know. And, and, mm -hmm. and then they almost turn it into this well i know just this much more than you so therefore you don't know anything kind of attitude 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just, it's I've horrible. noticed that as well. It, it, it makes it hard to engage with people when, like me, I, I, I say from the jump, I'm biased. I get a chance. Uh, I'll put one down. But, uh, again, it, it's all in the context of experience. Right. And for those having good experiences, hey, that, that's cool. But be aware, there's the potential for ugly going on. Yeah. Uh, well, you've got that potential with any major predator. I mean, look at grizzly right. bears. I mean, I, I was up in Rocky Mountain yeah, National oh, years ago, yeah. and I rounded a corner and on the trail, and there was a grizzly bear. And I told my buddies, I said, don't run. And, of course, of course I heard them in the distance. <laughs> and me and the bear kind of looked at each other like, well, I'm not going to try to eat you if you don't try to eat me. And we just kind of went our separate ways. But had that been close to hibernation time, I might have been a, I might have been a bear snack. Yeah. 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 It's the same and way I, with gators. I hate bear attacks, too. Yeah. Yeah, bear, bear attacks bear ain't nothing nice. Nasty. I've seen a lady. Yeah, feeding uh, feeding a bear hot dogs at the dump. Dumbest, dumbest shit, I swear, man. You know, trying to get a, a Polaroid picture, feeding the bear a freaking hot dog, and, and she loses three of her fingers. Uh, and it, it, it was quick. And that hot dog was like extra and, crunchy. <laughs> yeah, hot dog and three fingers were gone in a heartbeat. You know, the, best is when, the best is when yeah. they go to Yellowstone. You ever see those videos when they drive through and everybody oh, yeah. stop it? No. I'm like, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. Stay in the vehicle. Like Yellowstone was the guy that tried to go up and pet the pet the bison. Yeah. Yes. yeah. He gets up there and yeah. all of a sudden you just see go, and he's like flying in the Yeah, I see that. Yeah. I mean, even with that ahead. elk. That elk, that guy was trying to get oh, away from yeah. that elk. Yeah. Did you see the one where the elk kicked the guy's door? When he yeah. was behind it trying to get a picture? Oh, gee. Yeah. yeah. Uh, People don't realize that's the whole thing. Wild animals might look cute and cuddly, but they're not friendly. They're wild, wild animals. Uh, it's, yeah. I, there was a, I used to watch, um, uh, it's called Northwoods Law. It's about the about yeah. the, uh, the game wardens up in Maine. Mm-hmm. And they kept getting right. on to this lady about feeding black bears from her porch. And finally, they had to threaten to put her in jail. They're like, look, yeah. you idiot. Quit yeah. feeding these things on your porch. They're going to come in your house. Yeah. Now, I, I got. I was lucky enough to teach um, all those game wardens. Uh, I did hundred. I taught 160 game wardens over a three-week period, which was pretty awesome uh, up there during their spring training. Uh, it wasn't spring. It was like seven degrees. So that was <laughs> bullshit. Uh, false advertising. Right. We got a negative Yelp review, but uh, <laughs> but they were we were talking about moose. We were eating some moose one day on the range. They brought the the grill out and they had a fresh kill moose. You know they cut the back straps out and everything, and uh, they're like, hey, you know, if it's bigger than you and it lives in the woods, leave it the hell alone. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. just that's just good rules to live by because well, even moose in some cases, if it ain't bigger than you, like yeah, yeah, yeah. what are yeah. you gonna do? <laughs> you think it's a bright idea to go up and try to pet a badger? Yeah, yeah. You're gonna or, draw or, back or, a bloody stump. Or a, a bobcat, badger. or a coon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, any of those critters. I mean, they'll tear your ass to pieces. And you know, a moose is big, dumb, and mean and territorial. <laughs> those things will stomp your freaking guts out. So, mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, oh, it's there's it's video the of that Darwinism. It's Darwinism. Well, at its there was that guy stuff. in Alaska not too long ago that the kids had been tormenting this moose, and he yep. walked out of the bank and just was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and that moose stomped that poor dude to death. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in a heartbeat. Well, I've seen it, that video footage unedited, all bad, yeah, all bad. It, it, it's like Fred said, you know. I mean, if if it, if it was a if it was a life or death encounter, then that, that's one thing, you know. Don't go seeking, don't go seeking it out because you may get an outcome you don't you don't want, you mm-hmm. know. And but you know, it's situationally dependent. If you're far enough away from it and it's not bothering you, then you get some good footage, you know. But but life or death is a totally different thing. Yeah. Looks like Fred made it home. I'm glad he made it home safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Hey, no problem, man. You were driving in, in the snow. I'm just amazed you were able to carry on a conversation with us. Facts. Facts. Yeah, I, I live in here. I'm used to it, so it's not a, you know, it's like walking and chewing gum. In, in Missouri, it's not the snow that bothers us. I mean, I can drive in all kinds of snow. What happens is we get an inch, inch and a half of ice, and it starts snapping power lines and dropping trees. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's Up here, the they got a concerted effort working on power lines and stuff like that to avoid, uh, you know, those kind of power outages in the wintertime. Yeah, yeah, that's why I'm a firm believer in if I build a place out in the country, I'm burying all my power lines. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, ours are all buried out here, thankfully. And yeah. yeah. Man, y'all, it's been great. Uh, but uh, my Alka Seltzer, y'all talked about that earlier. I had a I had some before we started the show, and it's starting to kick in. My Alka Seltzer Cold Plus nighttime, so I'm getting a little bit heavy lidded. But did, did you I, dissolve them in a big glass of scotch? <laughs> I should have. <laughs> I should have to potentiate the effect. But at uh, least a glass of Irish. I mean, I, was, I don't know if I'd ruin a good glass of scotch. But. <laughs> I know, right? Some JMO or something. Uh, <laughs> but Fred, it's been a pleasure seeing you again, man. Hearing your story. Yeah, God man. bless you. Stay safe out there, Anthony. Always good yeah. to see you. DA, I love you, brother. Love you too, uh, brother. I'll see you. Lord willing, the internet's good at the hotel in Martinsburg, West by God, Virginia, on uh, on Saturday night. So, yeah, we should hear banjo music in the background behind you. Man, if you do, you're gonna hear me going <laughs> sick. You're gonna hear me going cyclic. That's for sure. So I will. I will see y'all. See y'all then. And Lord willing, the creeks don't rise. And uh, y'all take care. Have a good night. All right, brother. You be safe. All right. All right. Night, night, man. All right. Not y'all. Yeah, my internet keeps popping. I'm getting, we're getting bad thunderstorms out here. My internet yeah. keeps walking in and out. I don't know why. Yeah, my signal will disappear and then go back up to full bars and then disappear. Yeah, I'm Got getting lightning strikes. I'm getting lightning strikes around the house. You can see it. If, if I shut the lights off, you'll see a flash behind me. It's like, wah, and then all of a sudden you'll hear it, but it're bad over here. And Fred, you why. mentioned you were well, going to be working on a documentary. I know you can't, can't give us any details, yeah. but any idea when that might be coming out? Um, just before summer, I would suspect. I, I I got it lined up. I just have to get out to these places, and the weather is, is hellacious. Like, the first place we're going uh, is adjacent to these people's homestead, and these people had uh, one of these things rip one of their goats in half and throw it at their their cabin um yeah like it like that and so um i don't have permission to be on their property but the property adjacent to it is part of state land so i'm gonna start there um i've already been out there earlier this winter so i already know the lay of the land so to speak so uh, I'm, I'm gonna be going to places like that and uh two of them are kind of nearby well i can get to by road and then hike in but like the new Yukuk, i have to fly to bristol bay and then yeah you know take however much time it takes to get up there. Oh, I, want, for sure. I want to watch the yeah. documentary not hear about it hear about another missing 411 <laughs> case yeah no we uh we're, we're going to keep it simple nearby here but when we go up to new Yukuk, we're definitely going with enough people more than three um yeah. it worked out with two separate there. camps nearby so yeah it'll it'll be all right i hope anyway and if not you know maybe someone will find the good footage and you know here's fred's <laughs> last moment uh he was a trooper he, he tried well definitely be careful out there i'm looking forward to seeing the video and uh keep us posted whenever the video is about to go uh out for production when, when they're going to oh, be released. Yeah, yeah, I'll for have sure. You, we'll have you come back yeah. on and promote it. Yeah, that's cool. That would be I awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah, right, right now, we're, because we got we, we got time to kill, we're getting the equipment, the good cameras, good microphones, because, you know, the microphone's going to make a difference, picking up between the, the lower hertz up into the, you know, 16K instead of just the 250 to 750 range that most voice recorders pick up. So, yeah. You know, just just gearing up basically. So as soon as we can get out safely, then that's what we're going to do. Right, right. No, I don't yeah. blame you there. That would be yeah, that'd, that'd be a really good to range it. to get. I, I would love to see see what you capture. That's going to be interesting. How many guys you got going? Uh, it's just going to be me and my little brother for the first couple parts of the. It's probably going to be like a three part documentary. You know, one for each spot we go. Mm -hmm. But at this point, we got three planned out, 
and the third one being this fall on the New Year Cup. But it, we're not at this fall yet, so, you know, to be determined, basically, on that. Exactly, right. Yeah, it's good luck with all that, man, really. And definitely be Yeah. Safe. And as um, you could tell, it, I keep it dim in my house. I don't like bright white lights above me since that night that I have issues with white light above me because of that night spending with that damn propane or that white gas little Coleman lantern. That Coleman lantern, I remember them too, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah it just, times camping. Yeah, I, I still to this day can't use those damn things. I, something about the hiss and the, it just... Yeah, yeah. I don't know how you do it, man. Go back down. I mean, I used to hunt all the time. I don't even hunt anymore because of what I see. I, uh, I switched out, uh, switched out from using propane lanterns to those LED dynamo ones that you crank up. You know, crank the crank it for just two or three minutes, you get hours worth of light, and it's an LED. Mm-hmm. So I, I, yeah. I switched yeah. out to most mostly those because I don't ever have to replace the batteries and I don't have to buy fuel for them. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how you do it. One thing I wanted to ask you, Fred. Uh, yeah. You you said that the the with the incident at the cabin that there were several. Do you know how many there were? Uh, I know for sure five. Uh, the four that we initially the the three sets I shot and the one I shot at initially, and then the big one. So I I know there was at least five, and I, I can't because I was in quasi shock when when it was coming out of the tree line with the movement going on beside it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm sure all of them were accounted for because there was a lot of, of movement going on. Um, almost like, oh, they, they're getting away. Let's make our move, you know? Yeah. Because it, it took two seconds to get outside that door, 20 feet to the edge. We were motivated. We were fucking moving. Yeah. Like, we, we got to the edge there. So everything that happened in those moments was like, real fast uh, so they they were definitely moving in on us yeah uh, what color was the eye shine it was all that glowing red like amber amber yeah. red uh, like a like a deep blood red but bright if that makes mm-hmm. sense yeah yeah, yeah I can, I can yeah, see how that would be. definitely uh, be something that would stick in your memory for a long time um, right. Well, normally and, when we would beam them in the past, they would duck for cover, get behind a tree. These mm-hmm. just stood there. And that, and that was just all bad. Have and, you been back to that location since that happened? Nope. 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 You think that shotgun's still laying there? You know, I, I don't think so because of the freeze thaw of the water level. But mm-hmm. I would really, uh, because of how often people go out there, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's still stuff from that trip there when I get there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know if they, if they uh, after you left the cabin, if they destroyed it. Yeah, and, and I actually have some feelers out on that. Um, one of my buddies flies for a Bush Air Service out that way, and I asked him to, to take a look, you know, kind of get some recon on that. I haven't heard back yet. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, you know, there's so many places back there where this, uh, like my story isn't unique. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just serious. There's outside of, yeah, that was scary what happened and they tried to get us, but I'm not the only one, you know, there, there's accounts of, of trappers, especially, um, being terrorized by these things, getting trapped inside their cabin for weeks at a time and all their dog split team getting killed. You know, so they eventually make it out on foot. It, it just things like that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be stuck. Yeah, the winter. I, I mean, uh, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard uh, that. Do you, yeah, do you personally well, know of any stories of people that were abducted? You know, the, you know, from your community or from around you. <laughs> um, I know that there's two people missing out of New Studio Hawk right now. And the third person that was with them uh, saw what happened. They were actually at a trapping cabin of an elders getting it ready for preseason. So this was in the fall. They were going and getting, uh, because this elder was a lot older, they were going up there ahead of time to get firewood ready, 
uh, mm-hmm. make sure the wood stove is in operating order, things of this nature, just maintenance stuff for the guy, uh, check for leaks, that kind of shit. Well, when they were there, uh, of course, they, you know, they were doing some, uh, a little bit of light drinking with some beers, but according to the person that was, you know, part of the group of three that, that made it out of there, something similar happened as what happened to us. They, they heard a noise outside and they went out to investigate and they were attacked by three of them. Uh, two of them jumped on one of the guys and the third jumped on uh, the biggest one and the person that survived through it made it out of there and when he got back to New Stu, the powers that be because by time up here the state troopers come to small villages like that when they're called but mm-hmm. it's not like 911 call they, it may be days or a week out due to weather and you know travel conditions so by, by time the troopers made it there to you know start the search they already started the search but uh, uh, officially start the search uh, the guy was a basket case and drunk so what he told them they chalked up to oh he, he's on a bender he's hallucinating you know he's just you know you know fucked up or whatever so they dismissed it and just mark it as a missing person you know uh, suspected alcohol involvement they don't know yeah. that that they don't have any body um, right right and, and i've talked, talked to that, that person many times and Oh, jeez. He has a permanent eye twitch. Uh, I'm not making fun of one of the guys. It's kind of like a walleye thing. His eye is off when he's talking to you about uh, the incident. It's the damn thing. It's like his brain. Um, and, and the one eye kind of... Jeez. I feel sorry he, for that He guy. witnessed all this, right? He's seen yeah. all this. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he wow. watched two of them rip the one kid apart. And the third Jeez. one that grabbed the the biggest kid because uh, they were young, um, mm-hmm. not little babies. They were uh, somewhere in their teens, uh, just before twenty. And the biggest one that uh, I guess it would be considered an alpha got a hold of. Uh, he said he smushed him like you would uh, crinkling up a beer can, Oof. and it, it basically shot his insides out his ass. Oh, uh, according God. to what according to what he said. Yeah. Um, and, and that's when he got out of there because they had started um, consuming. Oh, dude. Dude. And you want to go out and do a documentary. Well, okay. Hopefully you're taking a good, yeah. a good size yeah. security team. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a four, five, eight, so calm around, potentially some giggle switches, but yeah, no, we're not. We're not going in um, ignorant. That's no, for sure. I not. No, I was. Yeah, I wasn't even going to ask you that. No, yeah, I figured you well, would. Well, if you look at the case of uh, of uh, Port Chatham, uh, there were hunting parties that went missing. Yep. It wasn't just like one or two guys. You know, there were no. groups of hunters that just didn't come back. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I would definitely, definitely be on alert and be careful. Yeah, yeah they're that's fast. crazy. They're, they're really fast. And that's why I pointed out, you know, when you're walking down a game trail, you, you might be the game on the trail and the predator could be, you know, 15, 20 yards to your left or right. It, it's worthwhile if you're going into an area, check and see, you know, check and see if there's a parallel trail, a smaller one next to the big one and see how it, you know, just be aware. These things like the ambush. So, so mm-hmm. You being up there, let me ask you a question. You being up there and, and um, being around the First Nations people and, and you sell, yourself, mm-hmm. what have yeah. they told you what they what they are from elders? I mean, what what uh, are they? They're just the, the hairy man, people, the, the monsters in the woods. Um, are they like a no, tribe? Are they a tribe of... of, of yeah, they... Of, uh, from what I was told, they're they're a type of people, but not people. They uh, they're mm-hmm. man eaters. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I tried. You tried getting it out of that them type here. of thing. They're not. Uh, it's really hard, yeah. and I'm one they of. They say them, they're, you know, they're, I, they're part of the tribe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even talking to like my elders, even though they know where I'm from and I'm not some outsider or some dumb guthuck or whatever, uh, 
they they still mm-hmm. they they don't elaborate much you know like saying mm-hmm. i was marked and they wouldn't elaborate like so there, there's just so much uh kind of a mysticism around it you know like this mystic kind of kind of vibe but uh, i think it's a lot simpler than that um i, I I've never seen anything paranormal with them in flesh and blood, kind of, you know, animalistic stuff, but there, there may be far to it that we don't even know. And I'm sure there is, because we're all ignorant. I, I mean, let's be honest, even those of us with the most knowledge on the topic, a lot of it's anecdotal from a book or from the, yeah. the evidence collected. It's not like, you know, someone sitting in the garage, chopping it up. Uh, so, you know, I am concerned about going out, but I'm not. I, I'm I'm excited about it, but yet terrified in a way. Um, just because of how intense it was. In, it, in 06, it was very intense. In 07, we didn't let it get to that point. As soon as we, you know, recognized, hey, they're moving in on us, we we were, you know, expelling. We were, we were getting out of there. Um, yeah. But, yeah, never, never good. You know, and that's, uh, I'm almost jealous of those people who are ha- having, you know, good encounters or are not so terrifying because I ain't seen that shit. I, I just haven't, you know. Yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I, you know, I'm just saying I, I, I don't see it up here. I've got a question for you, and I know this is uh, this is going to call for some speculation on your part. But you uh, going back again, where you said that you, that one of your elders had said you were marked. Do you think right. that means you're kind of destined to see these things, or they may have an interest in you for some reason? Yeah, uh, the brief explanation I got from uh, my great aunt was that one of them must have touched me when I was little. I said, what do you mean, touch me, you know? It's not like they were a Catholic priest or none. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> she was like, no, you were, you were probably playing in the woods and one of them touched you. And I, I, I still didn't get an explanation of that. I get the chills thinking about that because I, I can't, from my memory, I have a good one, but I can't pull anything from memory of ever being like physically touched by the one. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I wish I did. I wish any of them would have gave me more information on that. Because um, it, it could be need to know. You know, I no one knows. It's a creepy thought, though. Holy shit, man. I had, a, I had something, something similar, uh, an explanation given to me. A friend of mine, uh, his family moved here to Missouri from the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico. And, uh, and I was talking to his mother. And she mentioned something that she felt that uh, because of my exposure to things like this, that I was I was somehow marked by one. And uh, I think that's right. uh, that explains how how no matter where I go, I almost feel like I'm being watched. Uh, I know in yeah. LBL there were several places I, I was absolutely convinced I was being watched, uh, although I never saw it, never saw anything. I just I have this this feeling Knowing. sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and it's not it's all like the time. I mean, I, I can go, yeah, I can go out in the woods and go fishing and hunting, whatever, and you know, and, and not notice a thing. Uh, and then there'll be other times when it's just in the wind. You just, yeah, I, I, it's just this gut feeling, like, yeah, yeah. something's not right. I, I've been to places berry picking where it's similar. One, you know, one trip, several trips, just hey, happy go lucky berry picking, all good. And then other times, same exact path same exact berry patches you know a couple of years later or whatever it's just dread instant and, and being out in the tundra you can see things coming from a distance so mm-hmm. um at, like in ruby i never saw anything in ruby alaska but i i know just because of my my feelers going up and my hair standing on end and being like primal terror um, I know they're out there as well. Plus, the you know some of the guys I was working with, First Nations up there, uh, mm-hmm. when I was building the, the cabins for the mining outfit, you know they they spoke of the hairy man and seeing it along uh, just just below Ruby, going towards uh, oh I forget the name of the next village down 
is it guy Kona or something, mm-hmm. something. but uh there there's all all throughout the whole state you know it's just a different variation of ugly size and aggression but it's all aggressive it's all just nothing good like nothing nothing good yeah uh, Sean Bussard says, uh, were they cannibals or beasts? I've heard of people being cannibalistic that are actually changed their DNA into animalistic creatures. I think that's more of a Wendigo type story. But from what Fred was saying, yeah. you know, what we've read, they're definitely man eaters. Yeah, there's no there's no doubt in my mind um, that they are. Uh, there was I felt like a rabbit in a hole. Like when we first talked, you know, we were being hunted from the jump that, you know, they attempted to ambush us. I stood up for us unwittingly. It was autopilot. I'm not some hero. You know, I was, I was terrified as shit, but, uh, that, that I think, you know, that's the only thing that makes sense because they had us dead to rights throughout that whole thing. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, I think when, when I shot at the big one with the 30 odd six, I still think they thought they had us and that doing that may have stopped them from getting us. I, I don't know. You know, I think it definitely 20, changed 20, their 20, approach. Yeah. They, they probably just planned on beating on the cabin and forcing you to come outside. But then, oh, wait, wait a second. These guys are armed. We're going to have to pre- proceed with a little more caution because, you know, a lucky right. shot can still kill something. Yeah. And, man, I, I don't know if I hit the one I initially shot at through the wall, but I know I hit that big one. I know. I heard the bullets hit. I've, I've heard enough bullets impact big game animals. To know a good solid hit and I, I didn't miss i had already resigned myself to death i wasn't sitting there trembling like barney fife uh, i was i was calm and collected and i placed those three shots very quickly and and accurately uh, there's no doubt about that yeah well i, I yeah. definitely believe you i mean you know the uh, you know you, you know when you hit something i mean it's yeah. the same thing deer yeah. hunting yeah, you, you you know when you when you had a clean miss and when you nailed it just from the sound, um, but uh, yeah, I the I still can't get past the fact that I think I personally think and this is what I think about uh, people talking about Bigfoot slapping the side of a cabin in the woods. Uh, there's a lot right. of reports of people that were home alone they'd hear a slap on the side of the cabin. I think that was a deliberate attempt to draw somebody out. Um, yeah. if you would have walked out and went looking for it and it saw the opportunity, you're on the menu. Uh, and that's, that's, that's what I thought that behavior was for a long time. But right. to hear about them basically almost knocking your cabin off the foundation, they were definitely trying to get you come outside. Yeah. And I've heard, you know, I've heard through, uh, different tribal elders, not, not necessarily the, uh, Sugpiak, but, uh, you know, like some of the, uh, at the Baskin tribes, I've heard uh, some of the elders say that they can't cross a threshold. They can't cross into a uh, someone's dwelling. They can only, uh, they're tricksters. They're going to lure you out. And I think there's, uh, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, it, that would certainly kind really, of hint toward more of yeah. a supernatural element then. Exactly. And see, that, that's another part of it, DA, that bothers me is, okay, if there is, I, I didn't see it, or maybe I was so terrified, uh, maybe that, that that terror was the paranormal. I didn't really, because I was so lost in it. I, I, yeah. you know, that could be a potential possibility as well, because uh, for a while, I wasn't in my right mind. Um, yeah. When I was sitting there gripping that shotgun, uh, I, I wasn't right. But like when, you know, a couple of times a moth hit the window, man, DA, I tell you, uh, the, the, <laughs> the stress level, laugh or cry, I tell you, cause the, just that little bump of a moth hitting the window, yeah. uh, it was insane how it was those little moments like that, that I was resigning myself to, to death. You know what I mean? There was nothing about it that I felt I was going to make the other side of. Just none of it. It's it's entirely possible they were intentionally getting you getting you terrified. Um, I've heard of of uh, stories of people that prefer the flavor of an animal once it's been afraid uh, because the blood gets into the meat yeah. 
and it, it, it yeah. increases the flavor of the meat. I've heard of people that will intentionally not kill with the first shot uh, because they want that flavor. Um, I personally would rather put it down because I don't like tracking them through the woods, but I'd rather yeah, put it down. I'm not big on that. And be done with it. But you know, yeah, I've, I've heard several several places that they they have a preference for the flavor of the meat once it's afraid. Yeah, yeah. And, and who knows, uh, maybe it gives them another type of spiritual energy we're unaware of. Uh, I mean, there's so many, so many variables to it. That's why uh, I, I, I can't see uh, some of these investigators, their, their arrogance about it. Like, uh, like they're holding all the cards with their knowledge, you know, like uh, we were talking about uh, Todd standing earlier, that, mm -hmm. that poor son of a bitch, man. I tell you that guy, he shoots himself in the foot with his arrogant attitude. Uh, he really does. He, he has the most compelling evidence right there. But because he's, uh, I wouldn't say a braggart, but in a sense, like a real arrogant, like a professor would be, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I think that makes it so much easier for people to dismiss his work because they can just go, oh, that guy's a D-bag, you know, I, I ain't going to listen to that crap, even though he's got the good, you know, I, that blonde one. He does have some impressive footage. That, yeah, and that, that blonde flat face looking one, uh, that, when I saw that, that I, I get the chills thinking about it, uh, that, that struck a chord with me. I, up until that point, I thought, bullshit, you know, this guy's just a kook. I know what they look at, you know, because I've seen these things. So when, when I saw that, it totally changed my perspective. I was like, oh, okay, he's just a douchebag that's arrogant, and he's shooting himself in the foot. Because, I mean, I, I saw an interview with him the other day. He was talking to uh, Professor Meldrum, just like, you saw this, you did that, the tracks with this, with that. And Meldrum's just kind of shaking his head like, dude, you know, what, what are we doing here? So I think it's that uh, abrasive attitude that really shot him in the foot. But these people need to get over their, their arrogance because none of us know. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I'm, I'm, I'm the first person to admit I am not an expert. I, I've said that many times before, and I will always say that I am not an expert in this field. But I, I, I'm always looking to, to, to gather new stories. And because it's through these these firsthand accounts like yours and others that we start to see common threads, common behaviors. And that's right. how we can start establishing what we can predict as patterns and, and, and types of behaviors and even movement, uh, you know, where we could more most likely to find, have a sighting, what is most likely to cause a cause a, a bluff charge or an attack, things like that. But it's right. you know, you've got to put those together over time. And yeah, the, the only problem with that is. The, with so many people coming forward with like hoaxed videos and, and fake stories, they they really make it that much harder to gather good factual information. Right, right. There, there's so many uh, hoaxers out there and people that are like me. I, I don't care if anyone believes me or if they watch the documentary and when it's done or any any of that. Uh, I, I'm not big on the internet. I, I, don't, I don't need people to know who I am, so to speak. I just want people to know that there's a potential for serious danger. Um, uh, something's off about this whole thing. There's there's definitely a big piece of the puzzle that we're missing as far as uh, why the aggression, why are we being targeted, you know? Especially up here, you know, 500 to 2,000 people a year go missing. That, mm -hmm we don't have a big population man. that, that just, right. it, it just boggles my mind. Like, yeah, you know, and, a, big state. a certain amount of those are natural animal predation or people that just got oh, lost yeah, and died yeah. of exposure. But yep. even if you looked at that, those cases and said 1%, which you know would be of 2000 people, 1% would be what? Um, what is that? Like, like 20 people? Yeah. 20 people. If, even if it was just 1% of those 2000 people, that's still a lot of people that are being taken out by creatures, by these type of creatures. Yeah. And it, it's enough that we need to, to, to worry about it. Uh, but I, I think the, the number is much higher than 1%. Uh, you know, I would say yeah. probably 
considering how aggressive bears get at a certain time of the year and it's easy to get off trail and, and die of exposure. But even if it's 15 to 20%, that's a lot of people that are being taken out. Yeah, even on the Nishgak River between Akwak and Nustuyahawk, there's uh, old villages that are defunct. No one lives there anymore. Um, you, you can't get the backstory on those places, but knowing the area, I, it wouldn't surprise me that they moved because of, you know, these things, aggressions, like in Caligan alone. Uh, gosh, it's, it's been a few years now. Uh, no, there, there's people still living there. There's about a hundred year round residents, but the amount of activity uh, that goes there in the fall it's it's scary um i know what i was told i I wasn't there but someone had told me a a couple falls back uh most of the kids were shipped down to relatives in new studio hawk to hang out for a while because there was uh kind of like a probing of the the immediate area, kind of like probing the perimeter, uh, trying to get close to kids when they're out there playing by these creatures. So there's, there's stuff going on that it, it's scary to think about. Well, uh, anytime you've got a large predator, and I'm not just talking uh, uh, the, the hairy man, I'm talking grizzly bears, black bears, yeah, uh, yeah. mountain lions, any large predator, when it starts losing its fear of men, of man, yeah. That's a very dangerous moment uh, because at the, at the moment yep. when they realize that we're, we're on the menu, uh, you're going to see a lot more of these you know, cases that are like coming into town, uh, more and more missing people. Yep. Um, I know there are places in uh, there's a couple of small towns in southeastern Oklahoma where they were having trouble with Bigfoot creatures coming into town at night and raiding trash cans. And these aren't big towns or, you know, six, seven hundred people. But if they're right, if they're losing enough fear of people to come into a small town. How long will it be before they start coming into bigger areas and big residences? Yeah. And that's, you know, speaking on bears losing their fear, that was the number one reason. And I did bear control back in the early 90s and mid 90s was because they lost their fear. They realized, oh, these little things will run away. I'll get their fish. I'll get their moose meat. I'll get, you know, whatever. I mean, even hunters, Kodiak Island, you know, they call gunshots dinner bells for the big Kodiak brown bears because they're going to come after and run you off your kill. There's, you know, I've heard that story that. Uh, from hunters that uh, hunted in Bigfoot areas that said a gunshot was like ringing a dinner bell. It was a race to whoever yeah. got to the animal first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and typically when we moose hunt, uh, typically we're usually not horribly deep. But I mean, it's relative, you know. Uh, it's not as remote for a remote place, I guess, um, where we typically moose hunt. But even when we drop a moose and we're gutting it we usually are there with a large enough hunting group that at least one to two people can be on bear watch that time of year season you know august into september uh, the bears are really working to put on that that that, that for their winter weight so your the risk is high yeah the risk is high for counter with the bear so and again, the majority of the I had a buddy called me one time. Go ahead. I had a buddy called me one time, one deer season. And uh, he said um, that, he said, I got a question for you. So what's that? He goes, never had this happen to me before. I'm like, okay. He said, uh, we hung one up and gutted it out. And we were quartering the deer out and putting it in the truck. He says, and on the second trip back, the gut pile was gone. I said, what? He goes, yeah, the gut pile was just mm. gone. It wasn't like something had dragged it off. There wasn't, it wasn't any any, any uh, drag marks in the ground where there would be blood. He says, it was like something scooped up the gut pile and walked away with it. I said, well, that's freaking weird because I've never heard of anything taking a gut pile before. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, most of that gut pile's intestines and, you know. Ah, geez. He said it, it, it was all gone. Appetizing. Yeah. Well, you know, like initially that story I was talking about the elders that saw the bear get ripped apart. Um, they they were they were drinking blood out of the chest cavity. They they were it, it was more get blood, get the uh, 
innards and then like the limbs were kind of like a byproduct so you know there's credence to them doing these things to to beef up on their winter weight let's call it for because it's speculation i don't know it makes sense you know what i mean that they would want that you know the nutrient rich you know liver and you know things of that nature kidneys whatever it may be yeah. I know uh, from reading uh, Arctic survival manuals, it says that just to survive at you know normal a normal person to survive in those cold environments, your calorie count has to be much higher than it would be in a warm climate. Oh yeah, I, I'm five foot eleven, two hundred pounds, and my daily calorie intake is a couple thousand calories easy. Um, mm -hmm. Typically twenty five hundred when I'm. Fred, I think I lost you. Uh, I think we might have lost Fred. I think he froze up. Huh. Well, sorry, folks. I think we just lost him. I know uh, Anthony was having thunderstorms in his area, and uh, he suddenly disappeared. And I haven't heard anything from him. He hasn't messaged me, so I'm going to assume he lost power or Internet because of the storms. And uh, there was a snowstorm going on where Fred's at, so he may have lost internet as well. Uh, we'll give him a minute or two to see if he if, if he pops back in. Um, it was a great time to, to let everybody know. If you are enjoying the show or if you're new to the show, hit that like and subscribe button. Uh, hit that little little bell icon to, uh, to so you'll be alerted anytime we go live. And uh, share the video with your friends that enjoy content like this. Um, and hopefully uh, we can we can expand the channel and bring new P new faces into the group. And that's always a, always a great thing. And down at the bottom, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see uh, down next to the like and dislike button, you'll see uh, one that says the subscribe button and there's a join button. The join button allows you to join the channel at a couple of different levels and the upper level gets you access to exclusive video content. Uh, we just posted one la last week and we're getting ready to post another one this week as soon as the editing process is done. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll be having exclusive videos on, on there as well as on the Patreon. So if you haven't joined the Patreon or haven't checked it out, please check that out. That's patreon.com slash DA Roberts author. And that gets you kind of a, a unique access uh, to the DA verse books as they're being written. Uh, you'll have input on covers and things like that. Plus, uh, you know, we have other things available depending on which tier you, you, you get involved with. So hopefully you'll check that out as well. Um, uh, looks, looks like we lost lost uh fred completely um again unfortunately it's bad weather where where he's at he's out he said he was having a snowstorm said one of the one of the valleys nearby there was three feet of snow on the ground um oh we got a quote a quote from a question from bill sloan he says do you have a book update uh yeah i I've, i'm over twenty thousand words into the current project the fifth installment of the apex predator series uh, i'm hoping to have that into edits in the next couple of weeks we'll see how things go um, and, uh, I, I will keep cranking those out and try to get as many books out this year as I possibly can. My goal is to get 10 books out this year. We'll see if I hit that goal, but I am, I'm trying, uh, that is the plan anyway. Um, also Cam Buckner said that he is nearing completion, um, with, uh, the audio portion for Codename Wild Hunt, uh, Curse of the Wendigo. It's taken him a little longer because, uh, he, he lost his voice, uh, dealing with issues from the, uh, the big C, the black plague of the 21st century. Uh, so he's, He's been having a little little time uh, getting his voice back and getting his videos back out. Uh, so hopefully we'll have that one. We'll, that, uh, we'll have that book out as well very soon. But Cam is going to be doing all of the Codename Wild Hunt books uh, on audio. He's also going to do the Apex Predator series, and he may possibly want to do the Ragnarok Rising books as well. Of course, Sal Passos has been doing the uh, the uh, Lost Legion series, my sci-fi series. Uh, and I have not not yet selected somebody uh, to do the Lakeview Man and Nightmare Hunter series, although I will be looking for people to do those in the very near future. I actually already started looking. I just um, have a have a couple of people that are that were were kind of uh, getting um, audition tapes from. So we'll see how that turns out in the very near future. Uh, Susan Parsons is still waiting on the next book. Well, I just released uh, Lakeview Man three just a few weeks ago, uh, and hopefully I will have. Uh, apex five done very soon uh we're going to get that one out uh, we're already uh kind of 
playing around with the cover concepts. We've got some pretty good ideas for the cover. If you're a member of the Patreon and on the Discord uh, as part of the Patreon group, you can take a look at the proposals that we have for the covers in place. Um, but those those are, are those are just um, just pitches, just ideas. Uh, so we kind of want to get a little input on that. Uh, again, that's uh, if you're a member of the Patreon, you have access to that, that kind of thing. Um, the Patreon will really does help shape the future of the DA books. Uh, we were bouncing cover ideas. We're uh, you know we're selecting people to be alpha readers, uh, getting input on storylines. Uh, got a lot of books planned in the in the coming in the coming uh, the coming months and years. So uh, you know I've got 25 out now. And I've got plans for the next 25 already, uh, so I, I've definitely had a lot of have a lot of books that I'm I'm going to be working on. Um, hmm. Well, it doesn't look like Anthony or 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 uh, Fred either one is going to be back, and and hopefully that uh, Doc will be get get a feel better. I know he's going to be traveling. Um, Just wanted to, you know, you know, let me take the opportunity to thank each and every one of you. You guys are awesome. I appreciate you guys so much being with us. And uh, last night I was on uh, Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott, and uh, really uh, was 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 thrilled at some of the support that we got there. A lot of a lot of a lot of familiar faces popped up in that uh, that chat. I wanted to say thank you to everybody there. Uh, this coming Monday night, I am going to be on. Let me see. It's called the Quest Podcast, and as soon as I have the links for that, I will post that. It'll, it should be 7 p.m. Central Time this coming Monday, um, and I, again, I'll be the guest on the Quest Podcast. Uh, so I'll have the links up to that as soon as the show is set up and ready. Um, and it's um, you know, we, we've got a, uh, we've got a lot of irons in the fire, folks. We've got a lot of books and 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 audio books to get done, and and uh, more places to go shoot video. And I've got a, a lot of a lot of ideas that I want to do. Unfortunately, I will not be able to make it to LBL this weekend. Uh, although I am wearing my LBL T-shirt, I don't know if you can see it. It's got an elk on it. it says "Land Between the Lakes." Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, so I'll be there in spirit, folks. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, you know, Cam and everybody will have a good time there. Naoma will be there. Uh, I just I, I didn't end up be able to go because, uh, well, we just didn't really have the money this month. We were running a little tighter than planned. Uh, so. Hopefully the next time they have one of those gatherings, I'll be able to go. Um, so yeah, yeah, definitely check out the Discord, folks. Oh, it looks like Fred might be back. Yeah. Hey, there you are. Me? Yeah, we lost you there for a bit. Everything okay? Hold on. Yeah, it's just my service here. Hold on one second. No problem. Better mic. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Yeah, uh, Ellen to no LBL. Yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't wasn't a, just a, just wasn't able to do it this time. Uh, hopefully, next time. I know they do those those meet and greets a, a few times a year. Hopefully, I'll be able to go to the next one. Uh, but this one just wasn't in the cards. Um, but it also looks like the weather's fixed to turn bad for this weekend anyway. We're going to have snow here in Missouri, and it looks like a good chunk of that's going to carry over because LBL is not that far from me. It's only about five, six hours. Uh, so when we get nasty weather, it's not far on the heels that they're going to get it to. And considering how rugged the campgrounds are in LBL, I don't know if you know if any of you know what I'm talking about, but when I say primitive camping, it's primitive camping. Uh, so the roads are going to get nasty and muddy, and it, it's going to be difficult to get into some of those campgrounds. Uh, so hopefully they'll they'll still have a good time, but uh, I hope the weather doesn't get get that bad for them. Sorry, th this is acting up. Uh, I'm, my high speed is screwed here. I'm gonna have to let you go, bud. No problem, man. Thank thank you for being on, dude. I really appreciate it. And uh, keep me posted on your Harry, the Harry Man project. If uh, if you, yeah, if there's anything I can do to help, I would love to. Uh, yeah, it, it, I'm, 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 uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll shoot, very supportive. shoot an email here as soon okay. as my, uh, my high speed should cycle here in the next day or two. Okay. Well, you be safe, dude. And anytime you go back out there, be careful. Uh, yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. Trust me. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be on top of safety hundred yeah, percent. Absolutely. All right. Hey, thanks DA and hey, good night everyone. We'll talk to y'all later. All right, man. Be safe. And thank you again. Yeah. Ellen says the cryptids will wait for you there, DA. Yeah, yeah, they probably will. Um, I am planning on uh, 
we're looking at probably summer when when Doc is going to try to get down here to Missouri, and uh, we're going to take some night vision gear. And I'm I recently purchased a night vision camera. Um, we're going to go down to some of those abandoned campgrounds that you've heard me talk about, like Joe Bald and Combs Ferry, and try to film at night to see what we can get. Uh, I want to get a I want to get some good video for you guys to to share on the show and and to put on the on the on the channels. Um, <laughs> Lene Perkins says, uh, she says, uh, I would have been there last night, but I was listening to PRT, so it's Josh's fault, LOL. Well, you know, you were listening to a good show, so yeah, I, I can't blame you there. Um, no, I did. I, I forgot to announce to everybody that I was going to be on Spaced Out Radio last night, and it was one of those things that kind of snuck up on me. I'm like, oh, crap, that's tonight. Uh, so I put it out kind of last minute on my on my social media. So I appreciate everybody that was there, but I fully understand if you couldn't make it. Um yeah, if you guys have not had a chance to swing by the Discord, uh, join the Discord channel. It's free. Um, you know, there's no cost involved. I will post the Discord link. And, uh, you know, we talk about cryptids. We talk about the books. We talk about all sorts of things on the Discord channel. And I pop in and out you know, daily. And if you, ha if you have a particular question for me, uh, you can address it specifically to me, and I, I should be able to get back to you pretty quickly. Uh, but the Discord community is where we have conversations like the one we've been having tonight pretty much all the time. Uh, we've got multiple topics running at any given moment, uh, you know, things from the books, things from, you know, audio, things from the podcast, uh, it talks about things, talking about things in history, ideas for books. There's all kinds of conversations you can get and uh, be a part of in the Discord. And again, it's completely free to join. Um, however, if you want to get access to some of the Patreon only uh, levels in the Discord, you have to be a member of the Patreon community. Um, so, well, since it's it's just me and and uh, and we, uh, I seem to have lost both co-hosts and and our DS guest. I um. I'll start wrapping things up. And again, I want to take a minute and say thank you to everybody. You guys are just absolutely the best. Uh, I love hanging out and having these shows. It's like I've said it before. I'll, I'll, I'll continue to say it. This isn't this isn't like a like a like a structured show. It's more like hanging out and have a conversation with friends. And I enjoy each and every one of you. I love I love the interaction. I love answering questions. Uh, and I really appreciate it you, that you guys have been so supportive of the channel and supportive of the books. Uh, so there's definitely more books and more shows coming in the future. And uh, by being a member of the channel or being a member of the Patreon, that helps us to, to be able to do more. Uh, in fact, it was from the Patreon that I was able to get my night vision camera. Uh, so this is going to enable us to do more, to go out and film things I couldn't film before. Um, so hopefully we'll have a lot of that coming up in the very near future. And now that the weather's finally starting to get better, um, I'm I'm gonna make make more outings out into into places and certainly try to get some 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 low light vision low light uh, video and things like that. So um, <laughs> thank you, Lenita. Uh, you you are awesome. Thank you so much, Lenita. Lenita's <laughs> that show can't compare to this one. Da has a great chat room behind him. You guys are the best. I really appreciate you guys so much. I, I've said it many times. I don't I don't have fans. I have friends. And I feel that way about each and every one of you. You guys are like like good like good friends that we just hang around and, and chat. And I really enjoy this. I thank you guys so much. Uh, the growth we've had, and we're not even a year old. This channel's only like nine months old. Uh, we're, our our year is in May. The first DAX Machina was in May of last year. Uh, so, we, you know, again, we're not even a year old. We've got twenty one hundred plus subscribers, and I, I'm hoping to see that continue to grow. Um, and that's that's all you guys. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate everything you guys have done. Uh, you guys are awesome. You're the best, and and uh, I I just can't stress that enough. How much how how grateful I am for all of you. Um, again, if you have a time, if you have the time and want to check out the Patreon, that's at Patreon.com/da Roberts Author. You can join the uh, Discord, which I put the link up just a few minutes ago, and uh, you guys can join the Discord. Then again, that's completely free. You can join in on conversations. Um, you, you can you can become a member of this channel here on YouTube uh, and get access to special videos that aren't released anywhere else. So I hope you guys will check those out. And again, every bit of that goes back into helping us be able to get equipment and to go places and and film and 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 to find some awesome new material for you guys. And I'm always looking for new stuff to talk about. Um, 
and on the Discord, there's there's a couple of threads where if you've got ideas for shows that you would like to see us do in the future, you can put those links in, put those those ideas in there, and we can discuss them and talk about them, and you know, come up with with, with things that you guys want to see because this isn't just me up here. This is all of us. Uh, you guys are as much a part of this universe as I am, and your input on the books, your feedback on the books. And all of you, all of the, the comments and questions that we've had really do help to, to fuel the growth of the, the not only the DA verse in the books, but the direction of this channel. So thank you guys so much. I appreciate each and every one of you. And um, since I won't be an LBL this weekend, uh, I will have a show this week, this Saturday. I just don't have it programmed yet. Uh, I kind of held off until I knew for sure we weren't going to be able to do LBL, but I'll, I'll have a topic and, and a show posted for Saturday here, probably tonight or tomorrow. Uh, so again, thank you guys so much. I've said it many times. I will continue to say it. Stories are journeys that we take together. And I want to thank each and every one of you for taking this journey with us. Uh, you guys are awesome. You guys are fantastic. And I, I love being able to share my stories and, and to, to, to see the characters that I've created come to life through your eyes. Uh, hearing how people see certain characters or how much they enjoyed certain plots or characters they even don't like, it does help uh, to, to, to grow the direction of, 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 the, of this universe, of these books. So thank you guys so much. Thank you guys for being absolutely the best. I uh, love each and every one of you, and I will see you guys on Saturday night. Uh, again, I don't have the, the show topic posted yet, but I will have that up soon. And again, stories are journeys we take together bless you all for taking this journey with me. You've really, really put a huge smile on my face. Thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. Have a great night. Thank you for joining us tonight on DAX Machina. If you ever have an encounter of your own that you wish to discuss, contact us at daroberts at daroberts.net. You can remain completely anonymous if you wish. Pull your covers up tight and keep a nightlight burning bright. Oh, and did you forget to lock your doors? <laughs>